Welcome to the 12th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I just remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices? We have received apologies this morning uh, from Richard Baker and from Gavin Brown. Our first item of business today is to decide whether to take items four and five in private. Are members agreed? agreed? Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business is to take evidence from the Scottish Government as part of our post-legislative scrutiny of the local government finance unoccupied properties, etc., Scotland Bill's financial memorandum. I therefore like to welcome to the meeting the Minister for Local Government and Community Empowerment and the Minister for Housing and Welfare. And the Ministers are joined today by their officials, Stuart Law and Douglas McLaren. Uh, members have copies of all written submissions received, along with a space briefing. But before we go to questions from the committee, I would like to invite both Ministers to make brief opening statements. Who would like to go first? Ladies first. Okay, I'll go first, convener, and thanks for the opportunity to give evidence to the committee today. The council tax increase for long-term empty homes was introduced as an additional tool for councils to use to encourage owners to bring their homes back into use. Councils have significant flexibility in how they can apply the increase, and in 2015-16, 16, 16 councils are now applying the power. It is too soon to measure the full effect of implementation, as 2014-15 was the first year that a significant number of councils applied the increase after using the previous year to prepare for it. The legislative change is one of a number of measures that the Scottish Government is taking to encourage owners to bring their homes back into use. We continue to fund the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership, including part funding a number of empty homes officers who work directly with homeowners. We provide capital funding programmes and collectively these measures are having a positive effect in Scotland's communities. 278 homes were reported as brought back into use in 2013-14 and we expect over 500 to have been brought back into use in 2014-15. Some owners have reported that the council tax increase is what encouraged them to take action. By the end of the next three-year period, we expect to reach the point where 1,200 homes will be back, brought back into use per year, and this is a significant number, as 16, over 16,500 homes are empty for one year or more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Convener, and thanks also for the opportunity to come here. I hope it is as uh, enjoyable as my last appearance uh, in front of the committee. Uh, our non-domestic rates regime has to support businesses to flourish, and it has to raise revenue to help deliver the essential local services that businesses depend on. And as part of this, the rates relief, which in total is worth around £618 million this year, has to be targeted to provide the right incentives for growth. The Local Government Finance, Unoccupied Properties etc. Scotland Act 2012 enabled ministers to vary more widely the relief available for empty properties to incentivise their return to use. The changes we subsequently made by regulations were, as notified at Bill Introduction, to reduce relief for certain empty properties from 50% to 10% following the initial three-month rate-free period. The financial memorandum estimated this would save around £18 million. The actual drop recorded in the cost of empty relief for the first year of reform, 2013-14, was £22.6 million compared to the previous year. Now, other factors do bear on the year-to-year -year cost of this relief, but this figure would seem to be in reasonable agreement with the original estimate. This reform did not apply to industrial and listed properties, and the cost of empty property relief in 2013-14 was still £146 million, a considerable subsidy to support ratepayers. Members will also be aware that we responded to feedback from stakeholders and introduced the Fresh Start and New Start reliefs in the same year, relating to long-term empty property and to new build, respectively. Derek Mackay, during the passage of the bill, committed to review the effect of the changes once they had started to bed in, and I can confirm that the Scottish Government will be undertaking that exercise this year. I welcome the committee's initiative to undertake post-legislative scrutiny, and I am grateful for the chance to contribute and take any questions. Oh, OK, thank you uh, very much, Minister. And, uh, um, those uh, uh, statements were, were very helpful, as indeed was uh, the, the documentation that's provided. I mean, obviously, the reason why we're doing this is because when we actually look at financial memorandum, 
various stakeholders give us different opinions as to what the impact had been. I think it really is time that we saw how the legislation actually worked on the ground uh, in terms of what it was what was proposed, and this is the first exercise we've done in this, and we may do further ones in the future. Now, I'm, I'm going to open up with some questions, and of course I'll um, allow other committee members to come in in due course. Uh, when asked questions, either minister can answer. It's, it's up to yourselves who wishes to answer uh, the question. Um, one thing I would say, though, is the first question I would like to um, uh, put to, uh, uh, um, to uh, Margaret first, though, is, uh, um, Margaret, when you, you talked about it was uh, too soon to measure the impact of the legislation, given how long it's been out, but uh, um, certainly in, in terms of the space briefing we received, they say, and I quote, in relation to non-domestic rates, there are no systems in place aimed at monitoring the impact of the legislative changes. So how can, how can we measure the impact if there are no um, monitoring systems in place? In terms of the, the empty homes, uh, the, the council tax monitoring was changed to take into account that we could know the number of houses that are empty, the number of local authorities that, and reclassifying between long-term empty homes and second homes, uh, and some of the empty homes officers are doing that. So that's now recorded uh, the difference between the two, and it's much more accurate. Also, the local authorities report and whether or not they're applying the additional council tax um, on the long-term empty homes, so we can monitor that and how much local authorities uh, collect in from that, from doing that. So, so that has been monitored in terms of empty homes. And I think it's about nine um, local authorities that are implementing it in full, the full 100%. Nine increase. local authorities are implementing the full uh, increase. Three are doing a staged <coughs> increase, um, and another one is, is doing it sort of halfway through the, the year at the moment. So we're, that, that is all recorded, and that can be monitored. So, so I think it is being okay. monitored. Right, OK. Is, it, is the Scottish Government actually um, encouraging local authorities uh, to... Um, um, Pose the legislation full with full 100% increases, or are you allowing the local um, authorities to do their own thing, so to speak, as they see fit? It's very much up to local authorities. There's a lot of flexibility around the legislation, and it's about where local authorities feel that in their area it is something that uh, they should be doing. And I think Argyll and Butte uh, were, were very uh, supportive of this legislation from the outset, that they felt they had so many empty homes and their priority was bringing them back into use, not about uh, getting additional resources. And a number of other local authorities through the Empty Homes Partnerships are working in that as well now. But I think it has to be recognised there are some areas where it wouldn't be appropriate, uh, hard to let properties, where it wouldn't be apply, uh, appropriate for the local authority to apply um, that piece of legislation. So there's a lot of flexibility around it. OK. Thank you. Anything you want to, to add there, Mark or Tom? Well, I could come in on the NDR side and monitoring. There, there is a lot of data collected here. We have the valuation rules, we have council returns, and we have trend lines that took a fairly noticeable dip in the, the first year of, of effect uh, for the numbers of uh, unoccupied properties and uh, the, the figures that I've already related to for relief. The, interest, the important thing to, to consider when you're trying to monitor this and, and separate it out is that there are a lot of reliefs at play. There's £618 million worth of reliefs. And it may be the case that in some cases a property is brought back into use but then triggers a small business bonus or a charity relief or so on. So it can be quite uh, hard to disentangle exactly um, where uh, the, the, the change is arising from. But the, the trend that is there is pretty firm is pretty obvious and it's an evident one-year change so we believe that it fits in with the the estimates put out in the, the the financial memorandum and that we are we are seeing those happen okay thank you now in terms of what the bill is actually trying to achieve uh, the finance committee set a number of questions to local authorities for example uh, that i'm looking at north ayrshire because both margaret and i actually are msps for that area but there, we obviously have others here and uh, we asked uh, to what extent can any changes be attributed to the empty property relief reforms as distinct from wider economic factors? Uh, North Ayrshire said there's no evidence um, to suggest a change in empty charge from 50 to 90 percent is encouraged not to sell lease or empty commercial properties. Aberdeenshire said no evidence. Angus said no evidence. 
uh, most of the other people uh, who con other local authorities said no evidence. We also asked uh, the same question, uh, a similar question: Is there any evidence suggests that reforms have had an impact on speculative development and or regeneration activity? And again, North Ayrshire said no evidence to suggest that reforms have had an impact on speculative development or regeneration activity. Angus, no evidence. Aberdeenshire, no evidence, and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, I, I do realise that this legislation has not been out for a very long time, but I mean, is there not some concerns that the Scottish Government actually have that, the, that um, it, there is nothing to suggest that the legislation itself is a, much of an impact? It seems to be a, a general, um, uh, you know, restoration of economic uh, fortunes that have um, reduced the amount of empty properties. <coughs> When you look at the, the objectives of this bill, in part it was to better target reliefs and in part it was to deal with the, uh, the empty properties issue. And it may well be that in individual local authorities that are looking at a small piece of the overall cake, they're not seeing the overall effect. The long-term trend line, I have a graph I would be very happy to, to provide uh, in writing to you, showed a, a significant dip in the uh, percentage of unoccupied properties on the valuation roll. Now, that, that is collected by looking at the data from across Scotland. It's, you can question how much one local authority is dealing with the, uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole range of businesses that will be involved, the, the whole range of considerations. And this is not a, a great sweeping uh, a great sweeping measure that was going to wipe out all empty property relief and try and uh, fill every property overnight. This was an incremental step to, and to target those reliefs we provide more accurately. And as a result, we do have lower uh, contributions in empty property relief and we do have signs across the country of properties moving back into use. And I believe that uh, you know, in uh, response to question three, North Ayrshire did highlight that they had 26 commercial properties coming back into use. Now, they might not be able to uh, allocate the exact reason for that based on their own analytical resources, their own contacts. But when you've got that picture happening across the country, I think you're, you're seeing something that is incremental, yes, but positive. Yeah, I mean, but the issue, of course, is whether or not, you know, that's due to this legislation or it's just due to the, the economy picking up. And I think that's one of the things that we're trying to uh, pinned down. I mean, one of the issues, of course, that Spice have also uh, brought to our attention is that there, there hasn't really been a, a there wasn't really a baseline for the number of um, uh, um, vacancy rates in the first place. So it's kind of hard, therefore, to, to see where we where the, where there's an impact. Um, but I'm going to ask you another, just another question, just to move on a wee bit, because obviously I want to let colleagues in here, um, given time constraints uh, this morning, and that's with regard to. Um, pop-up shops. I mean, Highland Council referred to an increased number of pop-up shops, which it felt may be a response to changes to empty property relief. And again, North Ayrshire Council talked about the fact that um, uh, one property is being used for storage purposes for six weeks, um, then claims a further three-month 100% period in accordance with legislation, etc. Have you, do you have concerns about the possibility of um, people developing ways around this legislation, and if so, are there any proposals that the Scottish Government may have to try and counter that? <clears throat> Whenever you try and raise revenue, people will try and find ways to get around the system or to make the system most advantageous for them. Let's, let's not rule out pop-up shops as a, a terrible thing. And, uh, you know, these protections for uh, three-month leases were put in with, uh, with fine intentions. And if there are expansions of that if it is being misused that is something that we would be considering as part of our own uh, post-legislative scrutiny and any evidence that the committee finds in this process would help inform us and that would be something that we would be keeping under review. Uh, one, or, one or two local authorities, just a final question before I open it out to colleagues, is, is concerned about additional costs in Western Bartonshire. Uh, I have to be, be honest, in terms of evidence to, and a whole series of legislation often raise concerns about additional costs more than maybe other local authorities, but that notwithstanding, they've said that uh, they've got additional costs of approximately £45,000 per year on year. Um, and again, they, they don't seem to say that the legislation had, had much evidence of a positive impact, but their cost base has increased. I mean, what would you say to local authorities like that? Because, I mean, is it, 
in your review, are you going to be looking at the impact on local authorities in terms of additional costs um, that this legislation is imposing upon them? Well, there, there is a varied picture. Argyll and Butte quantified its costs as being lower than that of the financial memorandum. So uh, there is a, a broad range of, of views out there, and I don't know exactly what Eastern Barnshire has done that has caused their costs to go up, while others have perhaps caused them to go down. That would be something that, again, would be worthy of review. But if there are local authorities out there that have managed to do this efficiently, then local authorities should be looking at each other uh, to find good practice and collection. Thank you for that. Uh, I now open up the session to colleagues uh, around the table. Um, and the Deputy Convener will be next. Right. Thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, perhaps following on from some of the questions we had already, uh, I mean, I think the point's been made that only one authority which on council tax, which was the Western Isles, brought the full powers in absolutely immediately. I mean, was that disappointing or was that just uh, to be expected or does it matter? No, I don't think, from the, the government's point of view, it, it was disappointing. At the time it was, it was introduced, it was something new. Local authorities had been looking for it. It was never meant to be something that was prescriptive by government onto councils. It was to encourage uh, local authorities to look at empty homes and how they could be brought back into use and to give them another tool to do so. So for those local, local authorities that want to use that tool, it, it's there for them. And I think that, that's what it's about. And I think there is much more of a focus now on bringing empty homes back into use. And this is another tool in the toolbox. Um, I mean, clearly, I, I mean, I don't know if I'd anticipated it, but the local authorities, some of them are taking, you know, basically taking a bit of time to think about it and then introduce it and maybe introduce it gradually and so on, which does, to me, it seems to make sense. I mean, have you any idea when would be a good time really to, you know, look back? Are we, are we looking at this too soon is, is my ultimate question. Should we wait maybe, say, five years and then look back and we get a better picture? Or is that, is that too late because we might want to tweak things before then? I think, it's, I, mean, I think it's something that should be looked at in stages, and I think it's looking at it just now, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a useful exercise to look at it just now to see what local authorities are doing, to see it, the benefits of it, the projections that we have. But certainly I think it's too early to make any real indication of the impact of it at this stage, given that there's 16 authorities now applying it. Last, last uh, year it was 14, the year before that was just one. So I think we have to look at over a longer period to see the impact. But I think for, for councils, this is not about um, raising revenue. It's about bringing homes into use, much needed homes back into use for people that need them. Absolutely. And presumably that's a, a bigger question than some local authorities and others. I mean, I, you're not anticipating that all 32 will actually act on this, are you? Or do you know? Uh, no, I, I, I don't necessarily see that all 32 will be acting on it, but I think as more and more councils are using this tool and as we have the empty homes partnerships and they're working together in sharing good practice, it may be something that a local authority had previously thought was something that they wouldn't want to, to do or ne not necessarily be any benefit to them and they may see benefit when they see what's happening in other local authority areas. So it is about sharing that and getting that message out there and I think that's happening through the empty homes partnerships. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. I mean, Mr Biagi, the, the whole question of when can we really get a good view of this, because, you know, I think some of us feel this is quite early to be looking at it. And you said, well, there's a dip in your trend or whatever it is. But um, I mean, there's other things happening. The economy is maybe growing a little bit. There's different things happening. When do you think we can get a, a really good view of this? Well, there's the old saying, isn't there, about the French Revolution, that we're still trying to work out what the consequences are. Now, uh, you can take a point at any point in the future and look back with ever greater information. I think at the moment we have just a mid-year estimate for 2014-15, whereas we've got the, the full figures for 2013-14. I think once we have at least two proper data points, we've got some better understanding of, of trends and, and uh, we, can, we can work with that rather than simply working with estimates. So that would be, th that for us is the reason we're doing our post-legislative scrutiny on the NDR side this year when that sort of data is available. But you know, you can wait two more years and get two more data points and continue to analyse with an even more informed position. It's really when you want to draw the line and say this is the appropriate time. But I, I do think this is a little on the early side, but it's certainly valuable to be able to canvas opinions to gather what data there is and to look at it and certainly post-legislative scrutiny in general is something that uh, we welcome. Yeah I mean I think it's something this committee and other committees are, are going to look at. I think one of the challenges is what's the right time to, to look at it. 
I mean, just following up, the convener mentioned Western Bartonshire, and I was also interested in their paper because they seem to be. I mean, it doesn't go into huge detail, but it seems to be they've set aside certain property and they're going to do redevelopment. So they're deliberately holding on to certain empty properties because they want to put a few together. Have they been caught kind of unexpectedly by this legislation that they're sitting an empty property for a good reason? Or uh, is this just one of the things that we would have expected to happen? Is that an NDR measure? I'm not familiar with yes, I think so, yes, so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they talk about they've got a medical centre, for example, which is very difficult for them to let as anything else. Uh, so have, I think they're, they're just taking time over that. But um, there's obviously pressure on them to immediately be paying rates. Western Barnshire, I think, has some particular issues with regards to occupancy in both the non-domestic and the domestic sectors. They're noted for having a, large, a relatively large proportion of uh, their properties that are hard to let, whether that's domestic or, or non-domestic, and that is clearly a, an issue for them. Uh, at the same time, at the same time, the, the purpose of the legislation is to incentivise and to get people thinking about alternative uses and to get these things back on the market as much as possible. So you have to ask, where does that become too far and where is that at the right level of pressure and the right level of stick? And without knowing exactly the local circumstances in Western Bartonshire, and there are 32 sets of local circumstances here, I, I wouldn't be able to comment on exactly the issues facing them. But the aim here is to come up with alternative uses and to, to be able to bring these buildings back into use. And I would hope there would be ways. Fair enough. I mean, I suppose I just, you know, if you can assure us that you would be listening to the local authorities and if there was any kind of area that, um, you know, was being caught that maybe we hadn't intended, that you would be open to looking at that Yes, in indeed. Future. Indeed. And we'd be open to that in our own review and in general in dialogue with local authorities. I have met Western Bartonshire Council on other issues, on general issues, on introductory issues, and I have had correspondence with them on a range of uh, issues that were financial in nature, and this hasn't been something that they have raised, so it may not be at the, the top of their concerns themselves. That's great. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, a, a couple of questions, Convener. In terms of the, um, the, the non-domestic rates, and um, the Convener mentioned the uh, the lack of evidence in terms of impact on speculative development. Now, I seem to remember during the evidence taking that one of the, the concerns that was raised at the time was that this would act as a deterrent to speculative development. Do you think it's maybe a bit early for us to be saying categorically that that has been the case, or um, is there evidence that in, within the, the sort of year and a bit that you've got information for that speculative developments that were likely to take place have continued to do so? And that's probably something that's more uh, collected in information terms at the local authority level. We have been in dialogue with local authorities, and in particular Fresh Start and New Start have been there to try and deal with the, have been put in place to try and deal with the, the, the innovative, the, the risk-taking, the entrepreneurial side to property development to allow these, these new developments to continue. And I represent Edinburgh Central, and I remember when the, the bill was being proposed, business centres in particular having a lot of issues because they were having people coming in and coming out. This is something that the, the government has listened to and by putting these two measures in place I think we have addressed that and indeed by doing that uh, through regulations rather than uh, straight away it shows that we have been willing to adapt this in light of evidence that has come forward. In terms of the broad picture on speculative development, well speculative development tends to have very long horizons for planning, tends to have very, very substantial um, numbers of considerations at play and I, I would definitely say it's too early to tell overall the impact but we have been happy to take steps to try and address that and to, to forestall that happening. I mean, I, I always took the view during the, the evidence taking and, and the debate around the legislation that, that you couldn't view these measures in and of themselves as some sort of magic bullet and that they would interact with other circumstances, for example, um, the wider economic uh, situation. Um, so do you think it is possible to, to completely disaggregate the impact of these measures from other factors, or, or do you think it's a case of these measures being complementary to other factors in, in, in perhaps bringing properties uh, back into use quicker? 
Yeah, you've got, you've got a, mul a multiplicity of factors pulling mostly in the same direction now. If this had happened four or five years ago, <clears throat> the committee might have been faced with a flat situation <clears throat> whereby the removal of relief would be kind of pushing towards filling the properties and the economic circumstances would be pushing in the opposite direction and you might have ended up looking at it and saying, well, nothing's happening. Now we've got two factors broadly that are pushing in the same direction. So it's always going to be hard through simple look at the numbers to be able to say exactly what that difference is. But you've got a, a £22.6 million drop in the relief. The estimate that we had originally was 18. When you factor in some of the things that you can assess in quantitative terms, in terms of other reliefs, change in poundages, there is still a fairly large chunk there that is in the vicinity of the £18 million that was the objective to try and realise. So you could, you could perform interviews with every single owner of property across the country. You could go into all kinds of possibly disproportionate scale of research to try and tease out the, the, the mental processes and the decision-making, and assuming everybody was taking, taking at their word for that and weren't being uh, commercially sensitive and commercially confidential, you might have something. Or you can look at the numbers and say, there's been a drop, and under the principle that the, the fairly obvious uh, factor that has come into play in that period is the removal of the empty properties relief, by and large, then uh, that is the by far the likeliest suspect, and anybody who wants to try and prove otherwise really has a, a case to make there. Just, just <coughs> turn, turning finally to the, the long-term empty uh, dwellings, and um, I'm just looking at um, a, a table here which shows sort of numbers of empty dwellings uh, per local authority. And there are obviously some local authorities which have quite high levels of empty dwellings, but don't appear to have taken any action at this stage to implement the, um, the changes to the reliefs that the, the government has put in place. Ha, uh, has there been any indication as to why, for example, um, Glasgow City, for example, don't appear to have, have taken those steps um, according to the table I'm looking at, but yet they have, you know, uh, in excess of 2,000 long-term empty dwellings? It's not something that the government has looked at at this point, and it would depend in some instances if the spreads all around the city for that. If, if they were in one area, for example, they could exempt that particular area from the, the additional charge. But if they're spread around the city in among hard-to-let areas, areas of regeneration where people are being moved from properties to another property, it may not be appropriate at that point to, to apply the charge. Um, but we do have now, uh, we're working in partnership with uh, Glasgow through the empty homes process to look at what, what can be done. But they have to look at, I mean, local authorities can use discretion. They've got to look and see, is this appropriate just now at this place? And if it's just pockets throughout the city um, it, and it's hard to let properties, how do they actually exempt areas where there's clearly um, issues in some areas uh, that they may not want to, it may not be appropriate to apply the charge. Okay. But certainly that may be something that, you know, if the committee wishes, it may be something that we would want to, to follow up as the, the legislation progresses. If some authorities are not uh, picking up at all, we can certainly look at, you know, the reasons why they're doing it. But there can be a variety of reasons, and it is about flexibility. Okay, Thanks. okay. and welcome. In terms of the headline figures, it looks as if um, the financial memorandum was more uh, um, accurate in its predictions in, in relation to the non-domestic rates and the council tax. So if we can just start with the council tax, the costings in the financial memorandum assumed that all local authorities would apply the maximum 100% increase for eligible empty properties, and that's not actually happened. Um, I mean, did, did the government at the time actually ask local authorities or, or on what was that assumption based as it were? It was the assumption they looked at if for example as you rightly point out the, the financial memorandum was based on every local authority applying the, the, the full 100% charge um, and that I think it was based on very limited information we had at the time that around 70% of properties would be empty for a year or more um, and that's not the case 
and also local authorities and looking at it and putting the flexibilities in. So uh, maybe the official would say at the time um, whether or not um, local authorities were asked about that, but we, have to, we had to make a, an estimate in the financial memorandum and it seemed appropriate to take it to that level of what could be additional resources within local authorities. But I think at the time, Alec Neil made it very clear, um, recollect, I think, saying that it was not about the resources, it was about bringing empty homes back into use. That is really what this was about. The focus was in bringing homes into use and not about councils raising additional resources. And I think councils have been clear on that and have also been very supportive uh, of having that tool to, to do that, sh should they wish to use it. Councils but, were certainly asked at the time if, if they were going to uh -huh. use the power. But at that time, quite rightly, they wanted to see what was proposed in the regulations before they would commit to that, given that the primary legislation was primarily an enabling power and the regulations then set out how it would work in practice. And th they had factored that into their business planning. I mean, um, you said there, um, the Minister said that um, the key issue was the reduction in the number of long-term empty homes. So again, the financial memorandum assumed a reduction of 10 per cent. And in fact, um, there's only been, um, well, your written evidence suggests there's been a net reduction of, of 5 per cent. So again, even on that criterion, it does seem to have been, um, I don't know whether, you know, it's almost as if there's two overestimates going on in there. It's going to be save more money and it's going to um, release uh, more more homes and yet it, it seems to be very significantly out on both on both counters i mean i suppose uh, well if you could want to comment on that first Jim. there's a five percent uh, reduction in empty homes over the, the the authorities that are applying if i'm correct in saying that over the the local authorities that are applying the the increase um but i think it is a tool it's early in the stage we have, we're, it's, it's been used in conjunction with the Empty Homes Partnership and the Empty Homes Officers. Together, um, we're estimating an increase, a, a decrease of 1,200 empty homes a year being brought back into use. Um, and we hope to see that very soon. And I think that is significant. Um, local authorities are now looking at it, they're looking at it, like they're now reclassifying uh, between empty homes and second homes. They've spent a lot of time and effort in the first um, couple of years doing that, and that's what the empty homes officers have come into the whole thing, to see what is an empty home, a uh, long-term empty home, where a charge should be applied if the local authority is applying it, or what is uh, a second home. So that's part of the work. It is early in the process. Um, it was based on, you, you rightly say, it was based on every local authority applying a charge um, at 100%, and that, that's not what's happened. They've had to look at the flexibility, they've had to look at the circumstances, and also have to look at areas where, for example, if properties are hard to let, is it appropriate to apply a charge there when they're going to be lying empty for per, per, perhaps longer than they wanted? OK, so just moving on to um, the uh, non-domestic rates, the Minister said... Uh, um, that uh, you know the, the 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 savings were in reasonable agreement with the original estimate. So I mean, I suppose we've already been over this territory to some extent. But I mean, to what extent is that by chance, or to what extent is there a causal relationship there? Well, I always like to think that uh, the estimates are good, and that uh, if we get numbers that add up, I don't immediately go looking for nefarious uh, reasons to suggest that it, somebody was at fault. It is interesting, though, one of the the points that was raised before about are we too early for the post-legislative scrutiny? Uh, there are lessons in the financial memorandum where the estimates for. 2012-13 uh, that were available at the time proved to be a little bit different to what the actual figures were. 152 was in the financial memorandum, 169 was the actual outturn. But uh, we've got that moved down from 169 to 146, which, uh, in, as I said before, in terms of its scale, is broadly where, the, where the, the financial memorandum was. And we had the issue in this one, of course, that it was imposed in the same way across the country rather than simply um, being introduced in a, a local authority by local authority basis. So perhaps that meant that these projections were always going to be a little bit uh, firmer. Uh, I mean, I noticed your reference to uh, Mao Tse Tung's thoughts on the French Revolution, but uh, do you think uh, years down the line it will be easier to uh, 
know whether there's a causal relationship or is it always going to be a bit uncertain because it's related to the economic circumstances, etc.? Or, or could that become clearer as the, the economy becomes more stable? The more data points you have, the easier it is to model the different factors that are active on it. I think any economist would, would tell you that, or, or uh, accountant. But uh, as I said before, I, I see what we predicted happening, and I'm fairly relaxed about that. This um, um, relationship with other reliefs, because, for ex again, is, is there any causal relationship, for example, in terms of the increase in the small business bonus uh, reliefs associated with that? They seem to have gone up quite a lot over a two-year period while you know, the unoccupied... <coughs> property one went in the opposite direction. Is, is there any relationship there in your opinion? Or? Well, we've estimated that there's about £4 million additional on the small business bonus relief as a result of small business properties coming back into use. Other changes in that will be down to other factors. Okay, thanks, Sam. Okay, Jean. Thank you. <coughs> I think em empty homes must be just about the worst thing that we, can, we have in a, in a country where housing is such a, a priority for us and I notice in the SPICE briefing um, they say that with, without maybe information coming from much larger congregations like Glasgow and Edinburgh where the population is it's, it's uh, difficult maybe to, to use the evidence that we've got that, that where, the, where the largest number of properties are but I just wonder I mean what are we, do we still have incentives for district councils to, to help bring some of these homes? I mean, some of them are in, in really poor condition and so on. I mean, what, how, do we, how do we measure that? Do you, do you have that kind of information that says that of the, um, the 2,000 homes in Glasgow, whatever, that are, that are empty, empty properties, how many of them will it be viable? Are they... Uh, is there ongoing work to reduce that? I don't have exactly off the top of my head. There is ongoing work throughout Scotland in every local authority area to reduce the number of empty homes. Now, I, I would have to go back and check if, if some of the ones in Glasgow are due for demolition as part of the transformational regeneration work that's going on in Glasgow. So there will be empty homes that will be empty and not intended to be um, filled, but the, the Scottish Government has a number of incentives to local authorities to bring empty homes back into use, and that includes empty homes partnerships, empty homes officers. We're about to launch the, the town centre empty homes uh, fund. We had a loan fund to bring empty homes back into use, uh, which is, was used and has brought a number back into use. Um, and certainly, I, I'm more than willing to go away from today in, in terms of the point of empty homes and look at some of the points you make in, in, in Glasgow that was raised um, earlier, if there's something more that the Scottish Government can do to, to, to assist or get more detail of why the homes are empty. Uh, I'm sure that information will be there somewhere within the Scottish Government um, statistics, but not necessarily sitting within the council tax because of a number of factors about empty properties. But it's the priority for all of us is to get them brought back into use because they're a blight in the community as well as um, a home that's not in use, which is, is not helping anybody that's homeless. Absolutely. Um, and just on the... On the um, sorry. Just on, on the Glasgow point, Shelter Scotland through the Empty Homes Partnership and Glasgow Council are looking at some preparatory work as to how they could have a joint-up effort between Glasgow City Council and GHA to look at a, a possibility of a shared empty homes officer, potentially with funding from Scottish Government. Edinburgh City Council has an empty homes officer in place and they're making great strides in trying to target these problem empty homes. Edinburgh City Council has an empty homes loan fund operating. Glasgow City Council through GHA and another RSL also had a share of that and brought over 23 homes back into use through that funding. So we're, behind the scenes there's some significant work going on in, in both Edinburgh and Glasgow. Yeah, good. Um, on, on the uh, non-domestic rates, when, uh, as I remember it, the debate that we had in the, in the chamber, the uh, Conservatives got very excited about um, the property owners 
being outraged that they would have to, in, in a, a period of recession and so on, that we were being very hard on on the, the owners of property and being able to pay this amount of money. Have you had a, a lot of representation in that respect from people, um, individuals? I think that there were certainly there was certainly a, a strong representation during the, the passage of the bill, but uh, I may have to defer to my official on, on that since then. No, not particularly. I mean, clearly, when we come to do a review this year, we'll be engaging um, stakeholders and, and seeking their, their views on that. But um, it's not been particularly prominent um, since the passage of the bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That appears to have exhausted the questions from colleagues uh, around the table. Uh, are there any further points that any of our ministers would like to make to committee at this stage? Okay, well, thank you uh, very much uh, um, for your contributions this morning. Thank you to colleagues. I'm now going to call a five-minute uh, uh, suspension in order to have a changeover of witnesses and give members a natural break.
So let's reconvene the session. We're nice and early, so we'll get plenty of time to ruthlessly interrogate our uh, witnesses today. Not that that's going to be the plan. We will be asking you, I believe, uh, a number of questions from two uh, very fascinating papers. Uh, I'll just open, though, by saying to Jim that um, your whole thumb indexation relative population growth equation um, caused a lot of chat in the pub last night, you know? <laughs> A lot of the lads were disputing some of the actual equation you know, um, findings. Um, no doubt we'll continue that uh, tonight while watching the football. OK, so let's um, go straight into it then uh, with the formal proceedings. Um, our next item of business today is to take evidence as part of our inquiry into Scotland's fiscal framework. I therefore would like to welcome to the meeting uh, Jim Cuthbert of the Jimmy Reid Foundation and John McLaren of Fiscal Affairs Scotland. Uh, members have received papers from both of our witnesses, so we'll move straight to questions from uh, the committee, with myself uh, opening uh, first. Now, a lot of the questions I'm going to ask you, you've actually provided uh, detail of some of the answers in, in, in the papers, um, but obviously for the record and for discussion purposes, I'm, I'm going to be asking uh, some of these questions uh, anyway, just in case you wonder if I've actually read your paper. I can assure you I've read both of your papers uh, um, I would like to expand on some of the issues here. So, first of all, uh, in your introduction, um, Dr Cuthbert, you talk about, uh, you say it's extremely difficult to see how the Smith Commission proposals can be implemented in a fair and equitable way and without adverse uh, unintended consequences unless deep-rooted reforms in the constitutional and funding arrangements of Westminster are also implemented. And you go on in, in great detail to explain yourself. Just wondering, uh, to, to start off in terms of that, uh, I wonder if you can talk about uh, the no detriment principle as you understand it and uh, the impact you believe that would have on public expenditure in Scotland. And sorry, I should say Dr McLaren. Once, uh, once uh, obviously, uh, Mr Cuthbert, uh, Dr Cuthbert has answered, I'd be more than happy for you to respond to his comments and also uh, I would be uh, asking Dr Cuthbert to respond to yours, if you so wish. Sure. Dr Cuthbert. Yes, thank you. Yes, I mean, as explained in the, in the paper, um, th there appears to be a basic problem um, with if you let changes in rest of UK income tax affect public expenditure on reserve services in the, um, um, in the UK as a whole. Uh, and I, I call that the gearing problem in the paper. And it, the Smith Commission didn't specifically mentioned that problem in their report. But on the other hand, um, they, they brought in this principle um, that changes in public expenditure, uh, cha sorry, changes in uh, taxes in the rest of the UK, which are devolved to Scotland, should not affect public expenditure in Scotland and, and, and conversely. Uh, now, that principle, I would argue, is difficult to implement properly uh, unless you bring something like full federalism. But the way in which the Command 8990 proposals implement that paper um, is spelled out in that particular clause 2.14.41 or, 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 or whatever. And um, what I do in the answer to question five is to spell out how that, would actually, how that might actually, actually work. Uh, on the assumption that the, being, the gearing problem has been satisfactorily removed, that somehow um, rest of UK income tax receipts have been hypothecated to um, services, devolved services in the rest of the, of the UK. So even if that has been achieved, um, which I would regard as a very, very difficult thing to achieve, uh, you still have the implications of this particular clause, the no detriment principle, 2.4.14. And um, what that says is that when there is a change in taxation in the rest of the UK, a policy change in taxation in the rest of the UK, then if the... If, if the um, Proceeds of that are hypothecated to devolved services in the rest of the UK. I, pu I put devolved in quotes there, because, um, uh, you know, th those services in the rest of the UK which are devolved in, in, in Scotland. Um, then that will have an, a, an effect on public expenditure on, quotes, devolved services, and there'll be Barnett consequentials. And what 2.4.14 says is that there should then be an adjustment to the Bok Glant to cancel out those effects, so there's no overall effect on public expenditure in Scotland from the policy change in income elsewhere. And the example we give naturally is Trident, that if the rest of the UK government decided to increase income tax uh, to fund extra spending on Trident, then since that is reserved expenditure covering the whole of the UK, Scotland, given the current GERS methodology, would be attributed a population share of that. 
Uh, so overall public expenditure in Scotland would have gone up by that amount. So to prevent that happening, in, our, in line with the 2.4.14 principle, there would need to be a reduction in Scotland's block grant, to which the Scottish Government could either respond by cutting devolved services here or by increasing income tax. And uh, that seems to be an unacceptable position, and one that runs quite counter to what one might regard as the principle of Smith, that we would be in charge of our uh, own income tax and be able to make these decisions. In a sense, there would be a mechanism here whereby decisions made by the rest of the UK government would, in a sense, yank the chain of the Scottish government and force it to react uh, either by um, uh, increasing tax or cutting devolved services. So that is the mechanism which you know, is, spelled out, is spelled out here and which seems to be an unacceptable mechanism in, in terms of what the Scottish people thought they were getting out of, out of the Smith reforms. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, Dr McLaren, what's your view on, on that particular issue that uh, Dr Cuthbert's just uh, I mean, that is, <clears throat> that's, I think, a correct interpretation. However, whether it's, if that is seen as unacceptable, then if you reverse it and say, say the UK wanted to increase spending on something like Trident or Defence or Foreign Affairs, <clears throat> and that money only came, and that was, that was obviously the, the, the benefits would be spread across the UK. And that was only to come from UK, uh, so the rest of the UK tax rises, then that would be a free lunch for Scotland. So that would perhaps be seen as more unacceptable, certainly in certain parts of the UK. So inevitably, there isn't going to be a perfect solution to this. Um, there will be swings and roundabouts and compromise needed. Um, I think that Smith knew that this would, the people discussing um, and agreeing Smith knew that this would be what was happening. If they didn't, they didn't go into the implications very far. So I think that they, you know, the, the, the parties who were discussing that um, inherently or, or um, agreed to, to that would be what would happen in practice. I'm not sure how it would be a free lunch for Scotland. If the rest of the UK raises its income tax to spend on Trident and Scotland doesn't raise its income tax, or to say to, say to spend on, on ground force troops, then Scotland doesn't pay for the extra troops. That's not an advantage that you don't pay for. Right, Dr Cuthbert, what do you think? Well, I think we're getting into <coughs> questions of democracy there and, um, and questions of where decisions are taken. I mean, I, I, the Trident, I use the Trident example specific in this paper because that is one that would clearly be counter to what a majority of people in Scotland would, would wish. Uh, so effectively what is happening is that a decision is being taken by who? By whoever is deciding to raise the rest of UK income tax, um, Westminster or sub-Westminster chamber, which is forcing actions upon the Scottish Government. Uh, and uh, you know, John says an increase in Trident would be a free lunch for Scotland. Clearly, the majority of the population in Scotland would not regard that as a free lunch. They would regard that as a, a penalty, um, which they were then being forced to, to pay for. So I think we're getting into questions of where decisions are taken, the nature of decisions are being taken. And that comes right back to the fundamental point, one of the fundamental points I'm making in this paper, which is that really, if this is going to work properly, you need some sort of federal system. You couldn't have, essentially, South Parliament making decisions which were forcing upon Scotland things like increases in Trident and forcing them to pay for them. And another point made here, forcing them to pay for them in a way which goes beyond which what happened at present, because at present, if Westminster decides to fund Trident by raising income tax, then what Scotland will pay will be what that rise in income tax would yield over Scotland. Under the new system, what we would have to pay would be the population share of the increase in expenditure. And given that our income tax seats are lower than our population share, we are actually being paced to pay forced to pay more than under the present system for such a change. But the fundamental thing is, what sort of decisions have been taken and by what, and by what chamber? And a satisfactory resolution to that, to my mind, would involve there being some sort of overarching federal parliament who would make these decisions jointly in the names of all parts of the UK. Uh, and then questions about our UK income tax would have to affect only England and the, and the, uh, or the other parts of the UK. And the only feasible way of doing that really is to think of there being separate block grants to different parts of the, of, of the UK, 
with own resources on top of that being a matter for separate chambers for those different parts. But as soon as you bring together the chamber that is making the decisions about the rest of UK block grant uh, and Trident, you're really getting back to the sort of unacceptable situation we're in, at, we're in at present. So it's difficult to see how the problems can be resolved without that sort of separation of decision making. Okay, we are where we are and whether federalism, you know, comes up on the agenda post uh, uh, May is, 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 an, is another issue, but we really have to look at what we've got at the moment and where we are uh, uh, going forward. I mean, Dr. Dr. McClellan, in terms of, um, you, in your paper, you say that with regard to no detriment principle, one of the key issues relates to position where the raising of existing tax is not equally spread across the UK. In fact, Dr. Cuthbert comments something similar in his paper. For example, Scotland's share of income tax is not below its, its population share. I'm just wondering how you, you feel this is likely to impact on Scotland in terms of the Smith proposals. If, um, <clears throat> has, as has happened in periods of recent history, um, the wealthier become richer quicker than the, the majority of the population, then more of income tax will be taken, will be, um, will come from higher earners. I mean, I think already the top 10% contribute about 50% of income tax, something like that. Something like that. <clears throat> uh, but Scotland uh, has noticeably less of the richer people, um, a higher tax payers than the, the UK as a whole, which is why in JERS, Scotland's income tax contribution is 7.3% rather than its population share of 8.3%. So there's a disparity between, um, th th that means that, that UK income tax is likely to grow quicker if the, it's still the richer people who, who, um, whose earnings grow quicker. And that could have a, a knock-on effect of, if you're adjusting that by population, then that um, has a, you're taking more money away from Scotland than it would be raising an income tax itself. Um, like a number of issues here, some of these things take a bit of time to get in your head. I mean, I've done the same thing myself. So if I need to explain myself again, feel free to, to do so, because these are not um, equally when you ask me questions, I'll probably take a while to answer some of them because these are kind of mind meld questions sometimes. Um, so let's all fess up on that one. <coughs> um, there is a reverse to that, which could be that if Scotland decided to cut a higher rate of income tax significantly then that might act as a, um, an attractor for wealthier people in London to move to Scotland and disproportionately increase the, um, tax, uh, the income tax raised in Scotland. Um, equally, it might lose even more if it decided to raise the higher rate of income tax to above what happens in, in, in the rest of the UK. But because so much money in income tax comes from that higher rate, it's quite a key issue whether you, you win or you lose. And I think recent history suggests that Scotland would lose because um, it's been the higher rate of income tax that's been raising more, that's been the, the prime um, generator of, of, of um, incre any increases in, in UK income tax. Okay. Yes, I mean, I, I, I would agree with all that, and, and, and I think I'd put a slight gloss on it and say that it, it's very difficult to project how income tax receipts, relative income tax receipts, will move, and history has shown it's been a fairly volatile tax. But, you know, as uh, John said, we have to take a long-term view, and because of the differences in the income tax base and the many fewer of the high earning salaries in Scotland, what one can say is that there will definitely be periods when the tax base in Scotland grows less fast. Um, and then under Holtham indexation, Scotland will be, will be penalised. Uh, and the danger is that if once such a period starts, the Scottish Government would have to react either by uh, cutting services or by raising tax. And uh, there is a danger that taxes would be raised, 
which would have a detr detrimental, knock on detrimental effect on the economy, which would further damage the tax base, and you'd get into a self perpetuating cycle of relative, of relative decline. Uh, and the two points I would make really, would really be this plays to the wisdom of the choice of in income tax as being the primary vehicle for giving Scotland fiscal responsibility. Um, uh, it brings in the question of Holton indexation as being uh, vitally important. And it also brings in the question of whether Scotland will be able to grow its economy. I mean, the, the, the solution to this is can Scotland get the economy moving on a par with the rest of the UK? But Scotland actually has got relatively few economic powers to enable it to do that. I mean, the, the, the phrase we tend to use about this whole Smith proposal is responsibility for living within your tax base without the power to do much to influence that tax base. So, you know, there, there, there are deep issues here about the, the appropriateness of income tax, about the indexation, and about the other powers that are, are necessary if this thing is going to work and avoid the danger of Scotland slipping, slipping into, you know, a virtually permanent cycle of the relative economic decline. Okay, a brief supplementary on that, Mark. I was just looking to come in. I didn't come in. Was that? Oh, well. <laughs> okay. Jump, jump in the gun. Exactly. So I thought you wanted to ask a specific point. F uh, following on from that, uh, uh, Dr. Carl, but you say uh, it's impossible to implement a satisfactory Scottish fiscal framework in the absence of um, fundamental UK changes. And you've already touched on that. Um, you say the technical complexities of satisfactorily implementing the arrangements which are currently proposed are so great that it is likely to prove impossible to operate the resulting system in a fair, transparent, and acceptable manner. Now, it may be that we're trying to squeeze a quarter in a pint pot, but obviously we have this, we, you know, we have the Smith proposals as they are. How can we therefore optimise those in Scotland's interests, uh, assuming that it is the Smith Commission proposals that are uh, that are implemented after the election, not any further uh, change in powers? Well, I understand that the um, indexation arrangements uh, for the abatements to the block grant are not yet set in stone. And um, the one specific proposal made here, which goes back to the famous annex, and I note also that John makes the same proposal in his paper, uh, that rather than indexing the abatement for income tax in line with the movement in the whole UK tax base, it'd be done in terms of the per capita tax base. And I think that would be a potentially important step. I mean, it's, you know, it won't solve the problem, but it's something that nevertheless, uh, nevertheless should be done. Um, I think the other thing is that given the arrangements are not set in stone, um, the arrangements for reviewing what is happening are very important. Um, and a point made in the, in, 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 in Jim Reed's paper is that the, the arrangements being mechanical is not necessarily a good, a good thing. We are, after all, in a monetary union. And um, you know, a point that was made ad nauseam in the referendum um, campaign was monetary union implies political union. Uh, you cannot operate a monetary union without mechanisms for fiscal transfer. Now, that is not arguing that the previous arrangements that we had were satisfactorily, were satisfactory, you know, where, where the oil receipts went out of Scotland without being noticed and we got um, um, you know, inadequately compensated by, uh, by, and inappropriately compensated by Barnett in, in response. I'm not saying the previous, the previous arrangements were good, but we're in danger of moving to a situation where the arrangements for fiscal transfers within the monetary union are seriously weakened. And Scotland could find itself in a position even worse than, than, than Greece, where it's in a, a malfunctioning monetary union with inadequate arrangements for fiscal transfers, but without control of its own resources and its own economic policies. So I think that arguing for appropriate oversight mechanisms, and these would have to be high-level mechanisms, where um, a, you know, at a high political level a view was taken about the total flows of resources within the UK and the, if like the economic pressure within the different parts of the UK and whether that was just or not, and adjustments were made, would be one thing that, as long as we're in the, the monetary union, we should be, we should be arguing for. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Dr McLaren, just on these points that I've, I've raised with uh, Dr Cuthbert, a uh, fair, transparent, acceptable manner, how, how can they be, that be delivered within the, the arrangements as proposed by Smith? <coughs> I think... As I said in, in, uh, in my submission, um, you have to define what each of these things are. I mean, transparent is fairly obvious, but again, there are degrees of transparency. Um, fair, people's interpretation of what fair is will vary. Effective, um, again, you know, what is effective? And then mechanical, I think both Jim and I have said, actually, you probably don't want something that's mechanical. You want it something that's reasonably mechanical, but not wholly mechanical. So I think, and this is something that 
I think one of the big things that was left over that the Smith Commission didn't do, <clears throat> it got a political agreement to something, but didn't explain what the rationale, economic rationale, fiscal rationale was for that package, possibly because there was none. But that then makes it difficult to say why these things, why you're doing these things uh, and, and then defend something you know, and say what the perfect, the perfect way of, of implementing it is because you, don't, you can't go back to a, to a basic set of um, principles or rationale um, for, for them in the first place. So I think from the Scottish end, if you define or clearly what you believe these things to be, what, the, what are the elements of priorit prioritisation within them, then that would, that would help. Clearly, the things you need to move, look out for um, for Scotland that both Jim and I have brought up in our papers uh, are the issue over income tax, Scotland's um, position, relative position on that, population um, change, although that's not straightforward because if Scotland was to do particularly well through implementing what powers it has, then you would actually want the population element to work in your favour, whereas it works against us at the minute, but it could work in our favour, so that's something... Uh, but without perhaps the powers to more powers towards immigration, that's perhaps not something that's that's likely to to rise in the short term. And then also the demographics, which are as well as the population working against Scotland, the two are related. And then the the further the, the last point I would make on this is to that Scotland needs to, if you like, arm itself as best it can, and by by that I mean that a Scottish OBR. Um, Office of Budget Responsibility uh, and uh, a beefed up Scottish Finance Department, more like a Scottish Treasury, um, will be in a position that the inevitable negotiation, because there is so much uncertainty here, that will take place, that the Scottish side of it is, has sufficient or better ammunition than the other side in terms of determining what would, um, what should, uh, what, what would be fair um, and what are the likely consequences of something happening. Now, this, although Barnett is fairly mechanical, this happened even under Barnett. Um, a classic example which I've used before is that to, to work out the consequentials, you had to decide whether something that was in, in place in the rest of the UK also happened in Scotland. And um, there were, when a lot of money was being put into the London under, Underground, <clears throat> it was the claim from the Treasury was that no, no money should go to Scotland because there was no consequentials until somebody pointed out that Glasgow had its own underground. And so there was a, an, a, a settlement made, um, and that, again, is not mechanical. Um, that's a very, pretty obvious one, but there'll be other areas where you need to know the detail in what will ultimately be some form of negotiation. Fairness is, uh, you know, in terms of fairness, it's surely whatever doesn't detriment it would be detrimental to both RUK and uh, Scotland, I think that's probably... But the issue, of course, is how you judge that, I suppose. Um, um, sticking with you, uh, Dr McClann, because you, you touched on the issue of um, population changes, and you did say that, um, you know, any adjustment process may want to move in line with changes in UK income tax per capita. The downside to this is it does not allow Scotland to benefit from a net migration rise through being seen as a more attractive place to live and work. I'm just wondering if you can comment a wee bit further on that. <coughs> yeah, I mean, the, the hope, even in a partial form of, uh, of greater devolution, but for, short of full fiscal autonomy or, or independence, is that these extra powers, along with the existing um, powers over, over um, economic um, spending in areas like that will make Scotland, uh, will improve Scotland's economic performance and through that make it a more attractive place to come and work, um, therefore attract more um, migrants uh, into Scotland and therefore raise its population. Um, now, if that worked, then Scotland's income tax would be rising faster than the UK's, so you wouldn't want it to be per person adjusted. You, you would want to take all that benefit yourself. Um, the difficulty is, A, getting the growth rate up, um, and B, getting increased migration when the migration targets are in part still retained by the UK government rather than the Scottish government, which might want um, uh, more um, laxer 
um, uh, restrictions on, on who can come into Scotland. So that's this that's the sort of potential, but also the the, the, um, the, the, the drawback in the current position of it being realised. Yes, I mean, uh, I, th I think I would disagree slightly with that because I, I think there's probably be an asymmetry in this. If we're in a position of relative decline, then uh, you know, I, think it's I think it's important that we avoid that at all costs. If we were in a position where we've got the economy turned around and it was actually growing faster than the rest of the UK, then I don't think we'd necessarily want to grab all the benefits for, for, for ourselves. I think in those circumstances, um, you know, the, the economy would be prospering, we'd be, we'd be having all sorts of beneficial multiplier effects, and we wouldn't be worried too much if we were losing out slightly because Holtam indexation was still on a per capita, a per capita basis. So I think there, you know, you know, both in the spirit of operating a proper monetary union uh, and in the you know, nature of real politic, there is actually an asymmetry here, and it's more damaging to be caught on, into, in, in, into a cycle of relative decline um, than to lose out slightly in population indexation if, we are, if our economy was, boom, was booming. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to touch on one more area because I, I want to let colleagues uh, come in, and all of them do want to come in. And it's just, uh, again, Dr Cuthbert, on your own paper, you've talked about, and I quote, you say, the Treasury has signally failed to operate the Barnett formula uh, transparently over other witnesses who've said something similar over um, recent months. And you talk about the Treasury funding statement, um, uh, which indicates a fairly detailed level which items of expenditure reserved or dissolved and you also talk about the public expenditure statistical analysis and you talk about these databases TFS and PESA and not being aligned and therefore it's not possible to calculate other than by fairly crude estimates what the outturn expenditure for England has been on those services which are devolved respectively to Scotland etc. Um, I'm just wondering what impact do you feel that would ha it would have if these were aligned and that there were great, was greater transparency and how that could enhance Scotland's fiscal position? I, I think it would have had a huge impact upon the economic and political debate in the past because actually the, you know, there's always room for argument about to what extent the Barnett Forum was delivering convergence of per capita spend or not. Uh, uh, you know, it should have been much more much clearer what was actually happening in the past, and if it had been clearer, then I think things would have, would have moved forward differently. But it's not just that, that's just one suggestion. I think the whole process of setting Scotland's uh, block grant should be open and transparent. And I think we can see you know, a couple of examples of how things have gone very badly wrong in the past. I mean, one example is the paper by the Institute for Fiscal Studies on what, how, how non-domestic rates were handled in the Barnett formula. And they argue that, in fact, Scotland has benefited to the tune of a billion pounds because of mistakes the Treasury made, which were not at all apparent. Now, I don't know whether their figures are right, but certainly, um, you know, there's, there's room for a hu arg huge argument there about what, whether we... You know, whether we benefited unduly or not, which wouldn't have happened if the system had been plain and open. And another one, going farther back, <coughs> was a point, one that we identified some years ago, which is that the way that European um, uh, structural fund receipts were handled in the Barnett Forum that penalised Scotland, we argued, to the tune of a billion pounds. And you know, officials in the Scottish Government agreed with us that that, that indeed was uh, the order of magnitude to which Scotland had suffered. So in the past... Um, uh, the, the lack of transparency has meant that there have been mistakes, probably on both sides, which, which, which have been huge. And that was in the days when we just had the Barnett formula. We, you know, we're now moving into this much more complicated um, system whereby we're still trying to change basic changes to, 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 to link changes in the block grant to public expenditure in the rest of the UK or, or in England, while at the, time, at the same time parts of that public expenditure we want to discount because it's public funded by own resources in England. And trying to work around that is horrendously complex. So if in the past system we didn't know what was happening to the tune of you know, billions either way, in future the potential for argument and the potential for mistakes is going to be immense. It, it, it looks like almost an unworkable system. It certainly looks one, one that's fraught with difficulty and dispute. Okay, uh, Dr. McLaren, could you comment on this issue? And also in your own paper, you talk about the convergence feature will remain as part of a revised Barnett formula with no lower limit over how close the spending per head levels uh, can get. Uh. Just on the tr transparency issue, I mean, although there are problems with, um, uh, with transparency over Barnett, 
it will be as nothing in probably in comparison to what will be in place with this much more um, complicated uh, situation unless thing unless a very simple um, form of it is is introduced at which point fairness might be might be an issue <clears throat> in, with regards to the IFS figures, um, I discussed those in great detail with David Phillips, and I think that they are right, but it's, it's, um, it wasn't intended that way. It could have happened the other way around. Scotland could have lost out and may, still, may lose out in the future because it, it's, it's, not a, um, it, it's not driven by, by politics. It's just um, the way that things happened in terms of the way that... <clears throat> Um, uh, business rates moved in, in England. Um, the, in terms of the um, convergence, the reason convergence basically doesn't happen is because the UK's population keeps rising faster than Scotland's population, which means that while Scotland only gets a population share of the extra, which would produce convergence, the existing amount of money block that's there before you add the extra is then divided by a larger number of people in the rest of the UK than Scotland if that population continues to grow faster than Scotland. So that has been basically what has, um, what has tempered or even reversed in, in, in some cases the um, uh, convergence in how, how Barnet would work. And Barnet basically is supposed to work if both countries were growing, at, the population were growing at the same rate, will converge over time unless spending falls, which it has in recent years, but basically it's assumed that it will continue to rise and therefore will fall. <clears throat> and it will fall until it's zero, which is below the relative needs on anybody's estimate between Scotland and England. Um, of course, because we're nowhere near it, nobody, it, nobody pays much attention to it. But technically, that is what it is there to do. It just hasn't done it. Okay, thank you. I'm going to open the session to uh, colleagues around the table who have been very patient this last half hour. And the first uh, colleague to ask a question will be Malcolm, to be followed by Jean. Okay, now two very interesting papers, and in a way we've covered most of the main issues, but they're quite complex, so no doubt they can be revisited perhaps in a different way. I mean, I think the, the one area where you both strongly seem to agree is on this issue of Holtham indexation being based on growth in per capita UK tax base rather than the overall growth in the UK tax base, notwithstanding the population uh, opportunities for Scotland theoretically well I, th I think you agreed on that if you don't you'll tell me but uh, but uh, so that that was an interesting proposed adjustment to the Holton methodology which seems to be accepted by both governments so that's something that could certainly be pursued I mean I, I suppose that perhaps the bigger problem than the, than the population variation is this issue about the higher taxpayers particularly in the southeast of England is, is there any solution to that problem although or within Holton do you just have to live with it? I mean, I, I can't think of a solution, but presumably, theoretically, if you excluded the top 1% of taxpayers from indexation, would that help? Or is there any solution possible to that? It might not be acceptable, of course, to the rest of the UK, but I wonder if there's any theoretical uh, way of dealing with that problem of the top-rate taxpayers, particularly in London. I mean, that, that, that could be a possibility that one devises a synthetic tax base, which in some sense a bit like the Scottish tax base, and then sees how that grows in, in UK terms. But one is getting very complex here, and again one is increasing the, road, the, the, um, the room for argument. Um, and the other solution is one I've already mentioned, which is that one attempts not to make this too mechanistic. Uh, you know, one has an oversight mechanism that keeps good tabs on what is actually happening, and takes one view as to whether, in fact, Scotland is being penalised or not. The difficulty with that is um, one suspects that the different parties who signed up to Smith are actually coming from um, you know, different world views, if you like. And, and I suspect that the um, current West, or, or elements in the current West, the majority party in the current Westminster government, may well be taking a sort of neoliberal view that the main thing about a country is that you balance its budget and preferably shrink its state, and then the economy will look after itself and the equity will look after itself. And that is you know, a view to which I, I myself would certainly not, uh, not ascribe. And I, I, I think that 
you need powers, and also within the monetary union, you need ongoing oversight, and you need um, active adjustment of, of fiscal transfers to achieve some desired, some desired aim. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> probably some synth synth synthetic um, index could be pretty... I, mean, I think, I suppose the main thing is if you divide up the eight different income levels, so you track the UK in a different way depending on, uh, so it's, say, say, on a population share um, for um, up to um, the, the top level of tax, and then you, you track it slightly differently because Scotland's got a lower share of higher um, tax um, earners, uh, and you could probably find a way of doing that. But it, it is you're introducing a level of complexity that may change in the future, so you'd have to have a review to decide whether it had changed and how you do change it sort of thing. So um, it, it, it does become, you know, uh, quite... It adds another level of complication. So it could be done, um, negotiated, um, but it would have to probably keep on being negotiated over time. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be straightforward. Uh, well, thank that's helpful. We, we probably need to keep uh, thinking... Thinking, thinking about that. Um, now, just a, sh a brief question to Jim Cuthbert. I mean, you, you've two or three times talked about monetary union and fiscal transfers. I mean, how could, would you be able to, as it were, identify specifically what fiscal transfers were necessary for the monetary union rather than other kind of fiscal transfers that might be necessary for other reasons, if you see what I mean? I think one probably could. I mean, but, you know, it, one is asking a lot. One is, one, 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 one is asking um, for, the, for, for political and economic goals to be identified, you know, some sort of overall goal that, in some sense, um, uh, the economic pressures in the different parts of the UK should be should be equalised, so that no part gets too far ahead, like the South East is doing at present, or lags too too far behind, as Scotland might under Smith, or Scotland indeed has in the has has in the past. And, and you know, and equally, and we're not just thinking obviously Scotland, and England, we're thinking about the the, the the different parts within England as within England as as well. So we need to have some sort of view about how one wanted this country to evolve in terms of overall economic pressure, and then. Um, have some way of adjusting for that. And, it, and the way of adjusting might not necessarily be fiscal transfers. Uh, I, I mean, Mark and I did a paper some time ago when there was a, a symposium which David Heald held on, on fiscal autonomy, and we were saying, well, you know, one possible way within the union is not in terms of fiscal transfers, but actually adjustments of tax rates. But that would not be local determination of tax rates. That would be a central body taking a view that tax rates should be adjusted in a, particular, in a particular way to even out economic pressure. So there's a number of ways one could do it, um, but one would have to have the political will and the kind of body that, 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 that could make those decisions you know, independent of narrow sectarian or uh, in narrow you know, political or geographic um, interests. OK, now, two, two issues that I haven't really got my head around completely, but they're important issues. I mean, one is this gearing issue, which a lot of uh, your paper was about, uh, Dr Cuthbert. I mean, I, I mean, I can see why you took the example of, of Trident in relation to raising income tax, but if we'd taken the example of the state pension, for example, would, would that perhaps throw a different light on it and it might not appear quite so uh, bad as you're obviously implying it is? Yes, I, 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 I mean, in, I, I, I think that um, obviously some kind of changes the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish people might say, yes, we, we agree with that change, we're willing to um, either cut education and health here or increase tax to fund that or not. But I think even with changes like that, um, you get back to the question of the, 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 the democratic element of this. Uh, if changes like that are being made by, uh, essentially by... Um, uh, a pound in which we've got limited democratic or inadequate democratic representation, then it could still be something which irked and was unfortunate. Uh, and particularly if there were too many of such changes, it would mean that, that uh, the freedom of action of the Scottish Government to determine its own policy on income tax, etc., uh, which is what's you know, presumably anticipated under Smith, would be overridden by the adjustments it would have to make, as, it's, as I said, its chain was, was being jerked by decisions made by another chamber. So I think, yes, there's good changes and bad changes, but the underlying problem still remains. Mr. Chairman, I 
Presumably, if, if tax goes up to pay for Trident or indeed pensions, that would be dealt with by some adjustment to the Barnett formula. This is implied yeah. by two but, then, but then surely if income tax was reduced in order to abolish Trident, for example, uh, or reduce the pension, which presumably won't happen, um, would Barnett not take care of that as well? Yes. I mean, you know, if, 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 if it's bad going in one direction, it's liable to be good going in another. But in a sense, both are unacceptable. Uh, if, one is, if one is suffering from arbitrary gains or losses uh, due to non-fully taken not, not decisions which are taken by another chamber, possibly not in a fully democratic fashion, you know, particularly after English votes for English, after English votes for English law. You know, that alike is unacceptable. Obviously, when one is giving the example, one gives the example which will, um, which, which, which will be strikingly bad. But, but both, both the pluses and the minuses, in a sense, the system which, which throws these random pluses and minuses at you in a non-democratic fashion is not a good system. Dr McLaren's point about, about Barnett, which, again, I've never totally got my head around why convergence not, isn't happening, but um, you un, you've got in bold letters existing fault, so I don't know whether convergence is a fault or whether indeed that's part of the intention of Barnett. But, I mean, it was interesting your explanation because I'd, I've never really uh, totally understood it, but I'm, I'm still struggling a bit because you're saying that the reason that there isn't convergence is that the UK's population keeps rising faster than Scotland's, but... I mean, surely if that's the case, then Scotland's share of any um, UK expenditure in devolved areas will, will be a lesser percentage. I mean, if, if, the, Scot if the English population is rising more, then we'll get 8% rather than 9% or whatever. But only of the extra, not of the, not of the money that's already been committed. Right. Okay. So if you've got... Um. You, the extra is a pittance on terms of comparison to what, the, the, what you're adding it on to. And what you're adding it on to is being divided by more people in England because there are populations rising faster than in Scotland. That's what has the... So it's not about the increase, it's about the base. No, I understand <coughs> that. Well, that's helpful. Okay. But, 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 are, but are you suggesting in that paragraph as well that that could be a way of, um, as it were, um, that, that could be to the detriment of Scotland if people started aggressively applying the convergence principle, which isn't, doesn't happen in practice but should happen in theory. Is that what you're suggesting? Or? I mean, there have been shifts over time. So in, initially, there wasn't a, they didn't update populations, which was a pretty obvious um, one to do. Then they introduced that. And they also did it on real terms, and then they changed it to cash terms, and then they introduced that. All of these things made the, the convergence tighter, but it still isn't enough to overcome that. But you could start to introduce something that, can, that adjusts the base as well as the increase over time to make sure that convergence happened um, to some extent. It hasn't been, it would be, you know, it could be to any, at any pace, but you could quite easily introduce it. So could I just comment on that one? Yeah. That, 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 that I published a paper in the face of Alder Bulletin some time ago, which set out the algebra of uh, relative population change in relation to the Barnett formula. And uh, it, 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 unfortunately, the algebra is difficult, but nevertheless, uh, it, it is fascinating to, what the effect is, and it's a major effect, and the, the way it can cause, the way relative population can change can cause actual divergence is, is very interesting, and I'm happy to send a copy of that to the paper. Well, we around. all love your algebra, so if you could send us that, that would be good. Uh, last, the last point, the last point is interesting as well from Dr. McLaren about, with regards to the borrowing for current versus capital spending, it is unclear whether such limits can be strictly applied, and then it suggests they shouldn't apply in Scotland, which I would certainly agree with, but um, why can they not be applied in practice, though? Um, it, w through Barnet at the minute? Well, no, I mean, I don't, I, I, is that what you're referring to, basically? Um, yeah, I'm referring yeah, yeah. to Barnet there, yeah. so that uh, um, at the minute you're not allowed to, anything you get on the capital side, you're not allowed to transfer to the current side, but you're allowed, they're allowed to do it the other way around. I mean, it seems a little bit sort of like, you know, you, you, you really shouldn't do that, and we're not even going to allow you to do yeah. that. So it's just Well, I agree with you, they shouldn't apply, but, 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 but you seem to be suggesting... They couldn't, in principle, be applied strictly anyway. Because is that because you can't distinguish properly between? Well, there, there is a, a, an issue about what is uh, capital and what is current increasingly these days. But no, I, the, the point I was making there was just about um, was just to do with the Barnet thing, and that that, that could that, that should change um, to make it. Um, um, 
in terms of UK expenditure, what's current and what's capital? I mean, it's sort of relevant to current election debates in a kind of way, but is, is it absolutely clear what's, which is which in, in that regard? It's clear in the sense that it's, they're defined. It's not clear in the sense of um, how much, wh what in terms of education is really a capital investment rather than you know, just the, the, the bricks and mortar versus other elements of... PPP count as does that PPP payments do they count as capital or? Current I don't. Or? I don't think they're. Cap they, they come off. They come separately. I think they're separately identified in terms of the the budget. But I'm not. I don't yeah, think well, they're on the capital of, side. Yeah. Uh, Jim, do you know? No, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it's not a significant sum in both in Scotland and the UK. I mean, it, it eats into the budget considerably. I must try and find that out because I, I, I presume that would be resource our current expenditure, the actual I think it must payments. be, yeah, because it's, it's payments yeah, yeah, on, yeah, an, on yeah, an annual yeah, basis, yeah. so I'm pretty sure it would be on the current yeah, side, yeah. yeah. Plus, it would be eating into your capital. Um, allowing, if, you had, if you set yourself a capital limit, it would be eating into that quite considerably over time. As you yeah, a problem because the, in practice, <coughs> there isn't a capital limit, there's a resource limit, isn't there? Because you, you can turn resource into capital, but you can't turn capital. Mm. But I think quite often that people put limits in terms of how much, mm -hmm. um, I suppose it's more of a debt point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jean, to be followed by John. <clears throat> Thank you. I love the idea of having a mind melt question, but I suspect I don't have that. Um, I also uh, like the idea of any government trying to raise tax specifically for Trident. That would be really interesting. <laughs> Um, but it, it's, it's kind of on that theory that I do want to ask my question of, uh, I think, of, of, of John McLaren. When, you, when we were talking about that, you said that um, it would look like Scotland had a free lunch if, if all of the costs of that was met by the rest of the UK. Um, but would the no detriment principle not kick in on something like that? And also just to ask you, I mean, the no detriment, I think, is, uh, principle is full of complexities, but who will be the arbiter of that? Um, I think that in terms of the Trident, as, as was said in the last series of questions, it's not just Trident, it could be international aid, it could be pensions, it could be any of these things that the money was raised for in the rest of the UK, and then... Is Scotland allowed to decide whether it eats in, it, 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 um, it um, agrees to, to participate in these things or not? I mean, it seems to me that the decision was taken by Smith in the, in the Smith Agreement that these are reserved areas, and therefore, if more money is to be spent in these reserved areas, it's for the UK to decide it. And the implication is probably that Scotland will have to raise its taxes equally but if it doesn't, it will have to cut um, elsewhere. And the month, so ultimately, the rest of the UK will get that money back. Now, it may, there may be issues of democracy there, but it seems to me that that's Smith decided that, and that was the deal that was agreed on, well, so be it, but these are the areas that, we'll still, that we still have control of. Whether that's right or wrong, it's the Smiths. It's, it's where Smith came, what Smith came down on. Uh, in terms of arbiters <coughs> of um, no detriment, <clears throat> um, I, I guess it'll be initially negotiations between a Scottish, a Scottish OBR and a Scottish and then a UK OBR, or some sort of um, bodies of that ilk, um, both supplied with information and, and complemented by Scottish Treasury and a UK Treasury, that will then ultimately go to a meeting of senior politicians to negotiate almost in a similar way to what happened to Smith, but perhaps without a Smith figure. Um, so it will be partly based on, on the evidence that the, 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 the officials bring together and then the, the officials, the, the, the politicians, I guess, will agree or negotiate what the final no, no detriment should actually be. Could I comment on that question of who should be an arbiter? I mean, I think my main comment would be who it should not be, and it should not be the Treasury. And there you run into difficulty with the OBR, although I have some regard, no good regard for the OBR. It is 
a largely treasury staffed organization uh, and um, you know if, if one has a criticism of it and one does it would be that it's not been sufficiently critical of the assumptions being fed to it by the UK government so I think there's a problem if, we, if you know if we say uh, OBR should play a major part in this in this process but certainly it should not be the Treasury that does this uh, and the Treasury has a bad role in the past under Barnett of making this sort of decision I mean they decided for example that structural funds coming to Scotland should not actually come to Scotland because they've just uh, come out of the existing block grant which should be determined by the Barnett formula they wouldn't be on top of the Barnett formula uh, so Scotland lost out to the tune of a billion because of that so you know and the main thing I think is that the process should be open so that everyone can see what judgments are being made and ultimately it should be the court of public opinion that decides whether this is operating properly or, or not. Can I just add to that that if, if the Treasury, if the UK doesn't trust, sorry, Scotland doesn't trust the UK Treasury and UK OBR and presumably the other way around, the UK doesn't trust the Scottish Treasury and the Scottish OBR, I don't think we're going to get very far. And how you then go to the, the, the people which I have no problem with, although Smith didn't go to the people, um, and, and explain it and, and, and get them in. Then I, I don't, how, do you, how exactly do you go to the people and get them to decide um, what the, what, how to arbitrage? So I think that th there may be problems on both sides, but I still, still think it's probably the, the best practical um, solution. But Jim may want to come back again. Well, I, I, guess I'm no, I, I do not see how we can trust the Treasury um, you know, given the history of uh, mentioning of the, what happened on the um, structural fund receipts. And uh, you know, I, I'm not saying that the OBR is in any sense a political organisation, but I think they are hamstrung by their remit. And having adopted a basically forecasting remit, um, they, will not, they will not give you an appropriate appreciation of the various risks involved. You know, it's this, this old question that uh, in a policy influence environment, if you're forecasting, the normal assumption is to assume the success of policy. And secondly, if you're forecasting, uh, you do not adequately allow for black swan events. You may know that some things cannot go on like they're going on for 20 years and something's going to happen in that 20 years, but you don't know when. So you're just, if you're doing a forecast, you're going to assume it's not going to happen in the next five. So <coughs> with no criticism of political bias on the part of the OBR, there are good reasons why it is not really the appropriate body to uh, adequately fulfil this, kind of, this kind of remit. At a recent evidence session, we, we uh, heard uh, of the example of um, air passenger duty, which has, has been a, a, you know, something that the Scottish Government at least has desired to have control over. Um, and the example was that if we reduced air passenger duty and therefore attracted business that might normally be uh, going through Newcastle Airport, that that would be seen as detriment to Newcastle and therefore Scotland would have to make recompense. So, uh, you know, I, I think if, if we were talking about openness and fairness and, and explaining everything to the public, I think that w w what would be the point of that? Do you know what I, mean? I, I think that particular example is, is, is just ridiculous. I mean, clearly, there's sort of, I think you use first order effects and second order effects. They're first order effects that one might want to compensate for. Uh, but the whole point of Smith, in a sense, is to enable Scotland, hopefully, to do better. Now, you know, we don't have the powers probably to do that. But if the Scottish economy post Smith did start to, to thrive, there's endless scope for argument as to whether that is a, an overall, everyone is better off, or to whether that is the expense of elsewhere in the UK. I mean, one could, one could argue about that forever. Uh, and uh, really, there should be no, no concept that we are going into that sort of debate and working out penalties, second order penalties based upon that. I think that the example of Newcastle is rather than Newcastle complaining to Scotland, I think what would be more. Um, workable with if Newcastle repaired, uh, complained to the rest of the UK and said, because of this settlement, we've, you know, we've suffered. What can we do to improve Newcastle within the rest of the UK or within England sort of thing? So make us, you know, to perhaps give them extra things that, so they can compete better against Edinburgh Airport, which then takes you into a slightly more federal system that could be introduced throughout the UK, which perhaps wouldn't be a, a bad thing. But I would see it more as an issue for... <coughs> the rest of the UK government to find compensation for rather than for Scotland in that example. Um, just one other, other question and I suppose it, it, 
Would, if there were local income tax rates, how would that be squared with Smith? <coughs> um, I, suppose, I suppose it's up to the Scottish Government to decide, as it controls income tax, what level it wants to do that, whether it wants to introduce some degree of local income tax or not. Um, I mean, the, the, that... Kind of, Sorry? Would that be out, out with the income tax uh, calculations? Um, no, I think the income tax calculations would still be as before, but uh, in terms of you know, um, any compensating amounts, but within Scotland you could, you could um, devolve further income tax either partly between local and, and central or, or, or you know, retain it all centrally. But I mean, that, 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 lo that issue is, is one that hasn't been looked at or thought about much post-Smith, which, which also feeds into things like borrowing. You know, when Scotland gets its borrowing limit, whatever it is, or fixed or flexible or whatever, how much of that goes to local government? Should local government be involved in the negotiations about the level of borrowing that Scotland needs as a whole. Um, this doesn't, hasn't been given much, I don't think they are at all at the minute, but it hasn't been given much um, priority in terms of the um, discussions post-Smith so far. I, I don't think that the local income tax scenario you're envisaging would necessarily greatly complicate what's happening, what's happening with Smith. I mean, I think the key calculation with Smith will be what the abatement should be in, in the, you know, the initial abatement, the Barnett formula, for letting Scotland have control over in, in, in income tax, and that will be based upon exist, the, existing, the existing tax structure. You've then got the, question, the whole question of indexation, which we've been talking about, but the key modelling there will be done either on overall UK or on uh, a rest of UK income tax base, so that won't be affected by local income <coughs> tax decisions. And then you've got the question of what adjustments are necessary to the block grant for policy decisions in income tax uh, down south, which affect devolved services. And again, uh, those calculations, those should be the rest of UK calculations. So I think the key calculations would not necessarily be affected by the possibility of a local income tax within Scotland. Okay. And uh, just two very quick points. One on immigration. Should we... Um, it seems to me that Scotland needs people and that we could have immigrants from England. Uh, that's one point. And the, and the other point is that there is a, a opinion that the Smith Commission was done in haste, too much haste, and will inevitably be unraveled to a certain extent, uh, given any the, the debate in Westminster, regardless of the government. Is that how you see it? I mean, on the English migrants thing, <clears throat> by and large, well, m most years for the last couple of decades, we, that's, we have had net immigration from England, and not of old people retiring, I mean, across the spectrum. Not huge numbers, but, but by and large. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, the most obvious, well, probably the, the most obvious way to, to, to increase that, um, just technically increase that, would be to reduce income tax, particularly at the higher rate. You might not find that morally. Um, acceptable, but that is probably going to increase the number of people coming here and the amount of tax that stays within Scotland. Um, but so, but th there are other possibilities. Um, and in terms of Smith in haste, well, I think it clearly was done in haste, um, but it was demanded in haste, so he was kind of me meeting his remit, if you like. Um, but I think. I think my main criticisms of, of, of Smith were that um, he, there was an element of what we, what we need is world peace, and I think we're all agreed on that, but I'll leave it to the governments to work out the details on how we achieve that sort of thing. Um, now, obviously, it's not quite as bad as that, but there is an element of like, well, this is what we've decided. You work out the adjustments, you work out the no detriment, I'm off. Um, and I don't think that, I mean, you know, that hasn't helped for taking the next stages forward. Uh, and then there's also, I think, the, the, the fact that it was done in a, okay, there, there was meetings out in the, 
uh, with the general public sort of thing. But I don't know what from those meetings was taken and fed into the final um, final agreement. As far as I can see, it was politicians in a closed, you know, behind a closed door, which I didn't think was a particularly good way of m necessarily meaning that the populace, the population, the electorate agreed with it. Yes, on the, on the migrant one, I, I wouldn't want to say much, but I think the critical thing is, yes, I mean, m migration might be a useful way of helping the, getting the economy going, but the critical thing is to get the economy going. And in a sense, um, <coughs> what we want to stem is the Scottish syndrome of educating our own population to take jobs abroad. I mean, the critical thing is to get our economy going with high-level jobs, which either migrants or our own young people, well-qualified young people, uh, can take in, in Scotland. On, on, on Smith, I think it was done far too much of a rush. I mean, I think it was seven weeks from beginning to end. You cannot redesign the Constitution in seven weeks. It's just not possible. And, you know, it, 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 it was a botched job in, in certain important respects. But in certain other important respects, it was a remarkable job. And I think you, know, you got a group basically of politicians together under an accountant, and uh, you got what was in many ways a remarkable political document. I mean, some of the things it said about the Sewell Convention, about the Crown Estate, uh, some of the political aspects of Smith were actually remarkably good. But the, the, the wrong skill set on the wrong time scale, and they completely underestimated the importance of giving economic powers, and they did not adequately um, um, realise the drawbacks of the tax they chose, income tax, or the inherent limitation. If you just give one major single lever, <clears throat> you're not actually giving much power at all. Because in one single lever, income tax, Scotland, the Scottish Government will never be able to deviate too much from what's happening down south. So it's a constrained lever. And, you know, what do you want to do? You want to improve social equity. You want to grow the economy. Uh, you want to raise money for, um, you know, to counter austerity or to do socially, socially just things. You cannot achieve three uh, objectives in three dimensions with a single constrained control lever. So I think in certain respects, Smith was a terrible job, but in other respects... You know, reflecting the nature of the panel, panel of politicians, it, it, it was remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. John, to be followed by Mark. Hey, thank you, uh, Convener. I mean, we've, we've covered quite a lot of areas, and, and some of, I think, my questions would be kind of building on what has gone before. Um, for example, on no detriment, I mean, we've had uh, previous um, witnesses here who have basically said that, yeah, we can make the no detriment work at the beginning, so when a power is transferred... Uh, there should be kind of compensation or whatever uh, around that. But going forward, and the whole concept in Smith that uh, policy decisions that affect tax receipts or expenditure um, will either reimburse the other or there'll be an additional cost. I mean, that just is not possible, doesn't happen anywhere else in the world, and we can pretty well forget about it. I mean, do you agree with that? Well, I mean... That, that's not what's in Command 8990. I mean, Command 8990 has this particular interpretation of the Smith No Detriment Clause spelled out in, in paragraph 2.4.14, which is the one that has the consequences, which, you, you, you know, I explained in my paper and also in the annex to, to, to John's paper. So if the powers that be are now saying, actually, 2.4.14 is a dead letter, well, in a sense, well and good, but that means that, 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 that is a huge change to what they said is going to happen in Command 8990. Are, are you aware it happens anywhere else in the world, this kind of thing? No, I'm not, but I'm not an, not an expert on that. And in, in most other parts of the world, what you've got are federal systems. And, you know, the difficulties, the hole we've dug for ourselves, uh, both in terms of the complexity, in terms of the need for oversight, and in terms of the gearing problem, all these problems would disappear under a federal system. So if you, you, know, if you had a federal federal system, we just would not be in this sort of, what I would call, mess. Do they not still have a problem in Australia sharing out the resources? Oh, they probably do, uh, but I mean, resources are difficult to are difficult to share out. But if you are if you are in a proper federal type system, then you know with openness and a good will, you can get around these problems. There is well, there is quite a lot of devolution of taxes in quite a lot of different countries. They come with very strong strings attached, or there is quite a lot of yes, you, you've you raised that yourself but then you, we, we make compensations um, so that we're all about the same so actually <clears throat> I think what is being set up here is close to unique I mean I think maybe Spain is, is you know it's it's very asymmetric system 
um, might be similar to, to some regards, but um, I don't think, I think either there's a strong central grip still on what is the final settlement, as there still is here with Barnet to some extent. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I don't think, I, I mean, there's, there's a spice paper on this, which I think went into a number of uh, different countries, so perhaps they can, they can get you um, more examples um, of that happening. But I don't think there'll be an awful lot of lessons uh, to make it easier from other countries. And if there are, it'll probably be keep it as simple as possible. And the no, um, no detriment is a very difficult thing to do. I mean, that actually was my next point. You used the word simple there because uh, I think, Dr Cuthbert, in your paper you, you mention um, the, well, that transparency and effective scrutiny have been mentioned but not equity. Uh, and it struck me that also simplicity has not been put in there as one of the kind of key factors. Um, I mean, how important is simplicity? Because if we want even the politicians to understand it, let alone the public, you know, some kind of simple system is presumably an advantage? Absolutely, I would say, yes. Uh, it, it, but it's not obvious that you can, in fact, get a simple system if you are staying with Barnett. If you're saying, you know, that one of the things which will drive changes in the Scottish block grant, the Scottish budget, is changes in public expenditure down south. That, you know, that's the principle of, of, of Barnett. But then you're saying, but part of those changes in public expenditure down south are driven by local what will in the future be local decisions and income tax down south, so we need to take those out. You know, if, if you set up those as the, um, the basics of your system, it is a complex system. You know, complexity is inherent in the basic approach which has been, uh, been adopted. Yeah, there, are, there are two simple systems, Barnet and full fiscal autonomy. And as soon as you move away from those extremes, it doesn't really matter by how much. It becomes much more complex because you're going to have to work out what the adjustment bit is for them. I mean, both of you have been quite critical of this kind of word mechanical, which suggests that it would just kind of happen uh, according to whatever formula was set up. Uh, and yet, does mechanical not also suggest that it would stop the squabbling that goes on? Because, you know, we have not had a great success with the two small taxes we've already got, LBTT and landfill tax, and it's only been a one-year uh, adjustment. And that adjustment, as I understand it, was just the midpoint between the two sides. So, I mean, that idea of let's negotiate and talk about it every year has not been very successful. So that would indicate to me that maybe a mechanical system would be better? The system we've had, it's not been a fully mechanical system, but it's been more mechanical, as I've already said, has led to some very large potential errors creeping in, you know, un sort of under, under the radar. With the much more complex system we're going to, and with the larger sums involved in dealing with income tax and also VAT, the potential for errors under a mechanical system are magnified many fold. So you know, once those errors became apparent, and I don't know which way the errors would, would, would go, but you know, on the income tax side, they would potentially penalise Scotland badly. But once they became apparent, then they, you know, the, the, the apparent harmony you had under a mechanical system would rapidly disappear. So would you need to pick that up every year or could you just say, because we've previously also had evidence that, you know, in any system we have, you're going to have to have a major review, say, every 20 years or some kind of time like that. Um, can we not rely on that kind of longer term review to pick up the ups and downs that happen in the short term? 20 years was far too long a time period. An awful lot can happen in a, in a 20 year period. I would have thought that one... You know, probably an annual review is too often. 20 years is far too infrequent. I'd have thought maybe something like five, uh, a five-year review. But it's a question of who would conduct that review. Uh, you know, it would have to be conducted on a very statesmanlike, um, non-partisan basis. And uh, one doesn't really see the evidence from the political institutions in the UK at present, particularly what's happening coming out of some of the parties in the, um, the current uh, election campaign, of that, the ability to take that sort of statesmanlike overview. But, but I mean, sorry, yes. Just on the, the last couple of points, I mean, I think the idea that mechanical will stop squabbles is right if the mechanics are good. If the mechanics are bad, they'll increase the squabbles because it's so, you know, so blatantly unfair. Um, and I think what we're going through at the minute is a learning process that is taking quite a long time because we still haven't got all the Scotland Act stuff sorted out. But hopefully, as a, as a, as a, um, 
a result of that learning process, we'll get a better um, understanding and a, and, a, and a better mechanism in place. It, I think it will always need adjustment, but it's, so it's, it's to get it as mechanical as possible without it introducing unfairness and people real, uh, accepting that there, there could be an adjustment almost at any time, um, but it will be reviewed every, say, five years, but at any time then something else could arise. You know, changes in, in UK tax rates, changes in UK benefits post an election. You know, politics will play a big part in this. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned in, in, in my paper is fiscal rules. Fiscal rules will change willy-nilly, <clears throat> and Scotland will probably still have to go along with what the UK's ones are as the junior partner, if you like. I imagine in practice that will, that's what will happen. <clears throat> so you might, have to, you might find yourself having to change the mechanics on a regular basis if you, if you want to keep it mechanical. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Cuthbert, you, you, you think you used the word statesmanlike, um, and I mean, I, I take your point that you'd like a federal system and it's all kind of clearly laid out and we all know where we are. But I mean, the reality is, you know, it is devolution we're dealing with. The power is, remains at Westminster. It's going to remain at Westminster. We have to accept what they give us. Is that not the case? Well, yes, and that's, that, that's where we are. Uh, but at present, you know, the cards are not quite, you know, the dust is not quite settled. Uh, and we should be arguing for the best that, uh, the, the, the best that we can. And, um, you know, as I said earlier, part of, the, 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 part of making this work uh, will we'll be arguing for the most appropriate oversight mechanisms. Okay. Um, Mr. McLaren, you mentioned borrowing earlier on, and I saw it was in your paper. I was quite interested in that. Is there an issue then that, I mean, at the moment we have local authorities uh, with prudential borrowing, so they don't have a fixed limit. They can borrow what they can afford, and as far as I can see, that has largely worked. We've had evidence on that as well. Um, Scotland potentially is going to have some kind of limit, uh, although I personally would like to see it also having a prudential uh, borrowing powers. Um, do we need to tie the two together? Is that inevitable? Is, is a, a, I mean, presumably Westminster could give us a, an overall limit, but they're, they're just as suggesting an, a limit for the Scottish Parliament rather than local government as well? I, mean, I suppose theoretically your, your borrowing should be related to um, your income, the, what, you, what income you, 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 you can guarantee, um, and if you're especially going to borrow from the, from the market, uh, which ultimately most of it will come from, I guess. Um, so that's one way of, of putting it. But then what is the most appropriate way for local governments? Uh, you know, how much money do they actually raise themselves? Um, how guaranteed is it the money that they get from the cent Scottish central government? Um, so I mean, the markets and, and whoever was borrowing would have a, a view on that as to how reliable um, they are. Um, but I think th these things are, are fairly f uh, subjective. So I, I think in this area in particular, we're going to get to a political solution. I'm not sure, I have no idea what it's going to be. Um, but um, uh, Is, can, can we just leave local government aside for the time being and concentrate on what powers the Scottish Parliament can have? Or do we need to think about local government at the same time? I would have thought you needed to think of local government at the same time. I, I mean, the, the Scottish Government controls a large part of the um, budget for local authorities, and borrowing within Scotland is secured on Scottish tax resources, so basically it's secured upon income tax, non-domestic rates, and, and, and council tax, plus, plus, plus the smaller ones. Uh, so given the, given the commonality in the budget setting process, and given that the whole thing will have to be funded out of these three, three resources, I thought, I'd have thought you had to take in some sense an overview of what the overall borrowing capacity was. I, th I think that this goes, in terms of local government, this goes to a bigger issue of Smith was there to decide a change in responsibilities um, between central UK government and the Scottish government, which then begs the question of, well, I should, there should be, there be a similar conversation going on about what should be the relationship between local government in Scotland and central government, um, in particular, given the fact that non-domestic rates are fairly centrally set and council tax is um, impinged upon, shall we say, which doesn't leave an awful lot for local government. Perhaps that, you know, the, the, the next step after Smith is to have a Smith within Scotland to see what the right um, 
uh, both in terms of what the public want and in terms of economic arguments, rationale for what is the best split between um, local and central. Uh, I mean, for, Gene Urquhart kind of touched on that area as well. I mean, from my understanding, I mean, or from your understanding, a, I mean, Smith doesn't stop either the Scottish Parliament starting a completely new tax or a local authority starting a completely new tax. Uh, no, I think it allows them that power. It also allows them the power to increase any benefit, including UK benefits, or introduce new benefits. So it's pretty wide-ranging uh, in, in that sense. I don't know how widely understood that is in you know, Scotland as a whole, but it's, you know, technically there are a lot of powers. There are some constraints, which means it's difficult to use those powers, but the powers are, are technically there. Okay. And the final area I just want to touch on was the Scottish Fiscal Commission, which you've bo I think you both mentioned already, and the kind of how much of a resource do we need? I mean, they're only looking at two small taxes at the moment, but we did get the impression when they were in that they were quite under pressure, eh, certainly having to put a lot of time into it. How quickly do you think we need to beef them up for the kind of negotiation process, which I think you suggested? But as soon as possible. I mean, you, you, you need experienced people in... In, in these positions, not just new people who, who you train up, people who've, you know, who, who've got um, experience of the data they'll be using and, and, and how to understand and analyse it. And there aren't that many of them in Scotland, I don't think. Um, there's also, uh, so, so that's on the urgent side. And the, on the other side, there's something that can't be done very quickly, which is to get a good economic model of the Scottish economy, because the data just isn't there. Uh, and where it is there, the, the quality is probably not particularly good. Um, so that will take time to, there was possibly quite a lot of time to develop. I mean, the, there's two parts of the model, there's the economic model itself, and then there's the, 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 the tax side of the model, which it, it tends to be quite big in, in, in the UK sense. So you've got to, and that will be, the tax side will be easier to, to, to develop, but it's the economic impact on those taxes and the relationships between the two that is tricky um, and takes time to, to, to build up. Okay. Can I mention okay. another area where, where I think some attention needs to be paid? I mean, we haven't discussed VAT at all, uh, but that is actually going to be very significant. I mean, Scotland has no control over VAT, but we'll be getting about half of VAT revenues. Uh, and yet, the apportionment of VAT revenues is based upon the um, uh, household survey data uh, uh, for the UK as a whole. Uh, in other words, it, it's based upon an estimation procedure. And maybe as a result of that, Historic VAT revenue, Scotland's historic share of VAT revenues has been fairly volatile. And I think that a lot of attention needs to be paid to putting those estimates on a much sounder footing and um, also to coping with the potential volatility, volatility of VAT. This is an area which Margaret has been doing, my wife has been doing some, some work recently, and it's quite interesting actually to see uh, how tenuous the estimation of VAT receipts is at present. And we had the point actually came up here before about VAT that would it be based purely on the final payment by the consumer or would we also get a share of VAT all the way through? Because my feeling was that if a factory is making a lot of products, we should get part of that VAT, eh, even if the products were exported. Is well, that an issue? Well, but there are issues there. I, yes. I, mean, I, th I think it is based at present, as well, you know, the methodology bases upon final payments. But I mean, there are issues there to be explored. But the sheer data involved is, is you know, is is is, is estimate based and um, potentially not very good at present. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you uh, very much, um, and uh, Mark, you'll be next. Uh, thank you very much, Camina. I think, in, in terms of some of the powers discussion that there's been having as uh, somebody who's sitting also on the devolution and further powers committee i think that, that certainly around the benefit stuff there's been a something of a disconnect between what is envisaged by smith and what appears in the the command paper but that's maybe a discussion for for another day i just wanted to touch on it's been touched on a few times on the no detriment principle because again at the devolution committee um you you can pick your definition of no detriment uh, it would seem and and where no detriment is intended to apply and I just wondered, from, from your own perspectives, what your understanding of no detriment was and how it ought to apply to, certainly to the, the, the powers under taxation that are coming, but in general terms, what your understanding is of, of what is envisaged by no detriment? I, I think if I could go first on that one. Uh, I, I would regard the no detriment pr principle, as I said earlier, 
as being really a recognition. Smith recognised that there was this problem, the gearing problem, that if you allowed changes in income tax in the rest of the UK to affect reserve services, then you were in all sorts of trouble and you had to stop that somehow. And uh, you know, I, think, I think John summed it up very well that, 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 that it was if the Smith Commission were in favour of peace and they brought forward a no detriment principle, which was in general terms. And fine, that would solve the problem, but they didn't say actually how you implemented it. Uh, and then the detail of what you've got in Command 8990 is a particularly inappropriate way of implementing that. Uh, the problem is that I myself don't see a way of solving the gearing problem without fundamental change. And, uh, you know, as I said, the federal argument is, is, is what would solve it, but that's not where we are, unfortunately. There is, in other words, a fundamental problem around about this. Yeah, I mean, I think the, <clears throat> the basic adjustments for changing um, tax, different taxes and in, in, uh, income tax, and I should s stick with that one for the minute, in, in England, uh, the rest of the UK and Scotland, that was the main thing for which, and, and, and that's where the big money will be involved, that, that no detriment should apply. There's then the smaller things of if you change one benefit here or a little policy there, uh, the, the airport example sort of thing, should that be have a, a knock-on effect? And that's a little bit more y yes, but maybe. Um, so it's, it's less clear um, how the in the first one, there's, there's a clear detriment or gain that has to be adjusted for. In that one, it's less clear. And then there's a third category, which is the second round impacts that we discussed before, of changing something on income tax might have a knock-on effect on, on um, VAT or, or something else. And you adjust for those. And that, I don't think that was really addressed at all um, in Smith or, or, or in what I've seen. So that's kind of, I guess, up for grabs or up for negotiation. I mean, one of the points that's been raised and, and raised by Professor Heald is around the, the possibility of gaming uh, and where you have uh, the potential, for example, that you could have a, a decision taken at Westminster to, say, dramatically reduce uh, income tax, but compensate or offset that with, for, for example, a VAT rise. Um, now, what you would have in a the situation there is that uh, while there is hypothecation of VAT, it is only a the, I think the first 50% of the of, of VAT, which would be unaffected by by a by a, a, a rise, um, but you would have a situation where the income tax variations that would exist across the border might reduce um, Scotland's ability to react to that. Do you see that as a very real risk um, that exists, or is it simply a hypothetical one? I, mean, I, I don't think there'll be intentional gaming of that degree because it's so extreme and it would put other th not other things out of kilter um, and to be honest I don't think that the rest of the UK government will be bothering that much about Scotland that it will that it will, it will spend that much time on it however there will be unintentional it wouldn't be gaming but there will be un unintentional impacts from say uh, at the next election somebody decides well we're going to have a super tax above the 50 percent going to be a 70% tax, that would change things, or we're going to change what the, um, the allowances are and, and uh, how, how high you have to pay for, for no tax. And these things could have knock-on impacts, which are, um, you know, could be difficult to um, work out exactly what is no, um, um, no, no benefit, no detriment. <clears throat> so... I don't think it's gaming, but I mean, th th there are what he's talking about could happen just in the normal scheme of things, I think. I think, I, I think I'd be more pessimistic. I think there's a real possibility that certain Westminster governments would set out to game the system if they could. I mean, it's interesting to refer back to uh, the Future of England survey, wh whose results were published just before the referendum. Um, and the headline was... English, more or less English desire to punish Scots, whatever the outcome of the referendum. Now, we have issues with the Future of England survey and the, and the unfortunate um, leading question that was asked that led to that, that r result. But nevertheless, there's a wide perception out there of a desire to punish Scots and to reduce levels of public expenditure in Scotland to the UK, uh, the UK average. And uh, it, I don't think it takes too much imagination to imagine, say, a Conservative UKIP coalition at Westminster setting out precisely to exploit the features of the system to achieve that kind of result. So I think gaming is a real possibility. 
just just on the issue of benefit detriment. I mean, obviously, uh, if if decisions were taken. Uh, at Scottish level, which resulted in increased economic activity in a sort of post-Smith environment, um, then obviously there's a benefit that accrues through uh, increase in income tax. But at the same time, there are also benefits that would accrue at an RU, uh, RUK level around, for example, reduction in uh, job seeker allowance payments being required through the DWP, um, increase in national insurance contributions, which I think I'm right in saying would, would, would not float to Scotland, but would remain at a reserved level. How do you envisage that sort of what, what on, on paper looks a fairly simple scenario of more people and jobs equals more tax, but there's sort of more factors to it than that. How do you envisage that being worked out under a sort of post-Smith environment? Circumstances, everyone should just say, hooray. I mean, I don't think there should be any question of trying to compensate for that or whatever. I mean, that, that, that would be a well-functioning monetary union where you know, we, we, are, we are doing better through income taxes, the economy economy is doing well, Westminster benefiting, as you said, the national insurance, its share of VAT receipts, the corporation tax, etc. And I think everyone would just say that's, that, that's how the system is meant to work. The danger is that the system doesn't work like that and that uh, Scotland gets locked into a cycle of relative decline for the sort of reasons I've, I've set out. I think the first example you gave um, where in the rest of the UK benefits went down because it was more successful policy going through, <clears throat> I think there is a, an intention to adjust for that, so Scotland would get some of that money, some of that money back from the UK. It's, it's uh, not. I don't think it's 100% understood, but in the evidence that was given to the Scottish Affairs Committee on um, Smith, when I, I did a session with David Phillips from the IFS, <clears throat> and that I think that was certainly his opinion, and that seemed to be what was in the final report that was written up, which I guess they had checked with other people. So I think that that's certainly one that might be a, a, a no detriment impact, whether it's right or wrong. But I think that's what they were that they might be intending to do. <clears throat> Again, difficult to calculate. But but in terms of the other taxes, you know, higher growth leading to higher um, sales taxes and um, VAT and national insurance, then that would stay at the UK level. Okay. Uh, just to, just on another scenario, and just to get something clear in my head, there's been obviously there's been discussion around um, levying of taxes and um, how how that money is therefore allocated. So, for example, there's been discussion around uh, the use of the 50p tax and how that could be how the the proceeds of that could be spent, with a view that. Um, for example, money, the 50p tax applied in, in London uh, could lead to revenue flowing to Scotland. For example, one of the figures that's been spoken about is £250 million to the NHS as a result of the 50p tax within Scotland. Now, there aren't the level of incomes in Scotland among higher rate taxpayers for that money to be generated within Scotland, so it would have to be apportioned from elsewhere. Barnet consequentials don't, wouldn't seem to generate that level of, of consequential effect. So is there a scenario under under sort of post-Smith scenario where you could have a 50p rate that applies both in Scotland and in the rest of the UK, but there is essentially that hypothecation of revenue still taking place? I, I've explained that clearly enough. <laughs> I, I, I did mention mind melt. <laughs> I think mind is just partially... I think my, my mind melted a, a bit as well, but I think what I was, my mind was groping towards was this is really something that needs to be modelled. I mean, you're going to get Barnet consequentials flowing, but Barnet consequentials are going to be heavily modified by the abatement and by whatever form of Holtham indexation we have. So there's going to be pluses and minuses and, and you know, potentially different economic trajectories in different parts of, the, parts of the UK. I mean, really, before we can understand what, the balance of what was going to, to happen, one would need some sort of proper modelling of all the effects, it seems to me. And you know, we're rather groping towards this new system, which is going to have fairly profound effects, without having that sort of modelling being done. You know, if it hadn't been being done in a seven-week period, then that is the sort of study that should have been done and some scenarios worked out. Yeah, I mean, I, I very much agree with that point. By, use, by working out different scenarios and seeing what the impacts are, then you can determine what the outcomes are and determine whether they're fair and negotiate whether they're fair or not. And that can then mean you can put in place 
agreed mechanisms that aren't going to lead to a, an argument, but are more likely to lead to what you'd assumed in advance. Um, but as Jim says, um, I don't think anybody's doing that. If they are, it's just the OBR, because there is no Scottish um, organisation set up to, to pitch its, its own bit in, but I suspect they're not being done at all. Um, so, but it would be something that I think it would be you and the Scottish Parliament in general would want to see before it was a, you know, a, a final mechanism was signed up to. Okay. And, and not just an income tax, but in a variety of areas. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. That has concluded questions for the committee. Just one or two for myself, basically. It's on the Scottish Fiscal Commission issue. I mean, uh, what progress is being made um, in terms of being able to acquire the kind of macroeconomic data that's required uh, for the, some of the discussions and debates that are going forward in Scotland? Well, in terms of getting a, an economic model for Scotland, um, we're, I think we're in a pretty low, you know, um, pretty low position. Um, there are clear uh, uh, Scotland, even in something like GDP, you know, the, the, what the economy um, produces as a whole. Um, uh, we've produced papers on the, in this in the past. Constant price GDP for Scotland say, including a share of North Sea oil, would be a terrible measure. That's what everybody uses to, to measure their, their economic performance. It would be a terrible measure for Scotland um, because the North Sea would completely make it irrelevant because it's the cash price of the North Sea that counts, not the, the, the constant price. That's just one example. So Scot trying to understand Scotland because of the, the North Sea element, even though it's not in here, you still have to sort of like... To, take it as part of the, the you know, understanding the Scottish economy. Um, you've then got large foreign ownership, which could impact on things like income tax and that as well. Um, so you need uh, other measures to, to try and understand that. We don't have any, but we have a, a very poor understanding of the current account balance of payments. We've got some understanding of trade. Uh, these are some, just some of the basic building blocks. I, I, don't, I imagine our, our um, the, the data on invest, um, capital investment and stuff like that is probably pretty poor as well. Um, it's a big job. Not only do you have to start collecting that data, but you have to collect that data for a long period of time before you can work out trends in it and work out patterns. So, you know, that, that you're talking, you know, over a decade before you probably have a, a well-working model. Not so difficult in terms of working out perhaps what the, ta um, the, the impacts of of different taxes might be, although again, if Scotland's behavioural change, uh, behavioral, um, changes to, to different um, tax uh, alterations is different from the UK's, then you have to work those out yourself, and that again takes time to do. Um, so it's a big, it's a big task that we're not in a very good um, place to start, which just means we should start all the quicker. Um, we will have to make shortcuts initially, though, to try and. Um, work out. Could I comment on a slightly different aspect, which is the, the GERS aspect. I mean, we've had the GERS exercise running for many years, and a lot of improvements took place in GERS, particularly on the expenditure side. But even on the expenditure side of GERS, the, the position is not uh, by no means perfect. I mean, if you look into the detail, you find that the same apportionment factors being used by Whitehall departments, apportioning expenditure to Scotland. So we can't even be con confident that despite the improvements, the expenditure side of GERS is good. But suddenly the revenue side of GERS becomes very important. Now, in income tax, probably the changes that have been taking place in terms of collecting the Scottish rate of income tax will, will lead to an improvement in the data. But as I've already mentioned, on the VAT side, what we have is an apportionment, an apportionment of VAT based upon sample data, and that is suddenly going to become very important, and I, su I suspect is not up to the weight it's asked, being asked to carry. And as the situation evolves, other weaknesses in the apportionment of revenues as well are going to come to the fore. So I, again, it's very important that improvements be put in train there if, if you know, the new system is going to be soundly, soundly Just based. Add a, a little uh, denim to that. <clears throat> we haven't mentioned... Um, I mean, well, one of the, the, the big tax measures that we're very unclear about is corporation tax because we don't really have a very good understanding of um, where the, 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 if Scotland was, say, fiscally autonomous, where that would, that would end up. Now, we don't have corporation tax in the Smith. Maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't, but we don't. But they do have it in Northern Ireland. And therefore, that 
change has to be modelled to see what the impact would be on Scotland from what they do. So there's, there's, it becomes, this all goes back to the asymmetry of the, of the devolution of, of these powers. It becomes very complicated. Uh, yeah, yes, I take on board what you've said. I mean, in terms of jails, I understand that defence, something like three billions are portioned to Scotland, but less than two billions actually spent in Scotland, uh, for example. Um, now, given what you've said, and given the lack of a, a kind of adequate macroeconomic model, I mean, what should, should the responsibilities be for the Scottish Fiscal Commission as, it's, uh, as, it, as it grows, if you like, and uh, becomes more established? I think it should initially um, try, you know, I, I think probably looking at the example of the OBR is a good place to start because they can, they've already done it. So there's quite a lot of experience there that, that, that a Scottish OBR can draw on. That doesn't mean to say you use their figures. That mean just means, means how you set up the model and how it works. Um, and also there's the advantage that depends on, on what your, your, um, negotiate your final mechanisms are to negotiate no detriment and things like that. But if it is a Scottish OBR and, and an English uh, U, rest of the UK o, OBR, then the closer they are in what they do, then the easier it will be to compare data, compare analysis and negotiate between themselves. So I think that as a, as a starting point at least is a good one. I think it's more difficult to work out what a Scottish finance, enhanced finance department commit, um, should, should look like, because obviously we don't have a lot of the macro powers, but nevertheless, it still needs to be, I think, beefed up considerably. I think I would differ slightly on the question of relationship with the, with the OBR. Um, I mean, I think the referendum campaign was interesting, that the tendency was on the part of the people at the Institute of Fiscal Studies to take the latest OBR projection of the UK economy and to split it down to Scotland and to look at the risks associated you know, with the Scottish, the, the, the Scottish forecast. And that led to an asymmetry in the handling of risk in the whole referendum campaign. Uh, if, all we, if, if all we're doing is sort of tagging along behind the OBR and looking at a breakdown of the, to Scotland of the, the OBR projection, then we're missing from the whole debate. Uh, important things about risk because OBR doesn't handle risk properly. So I think if there are closer risk links with the OBR, then they should be used to, in fact, influence the OBR itself so that we're taking a more informed view about risk. I mean, this is, this is relevant because if you look at the current uh, general election campaign, then the, um, certain parties are putting forward policies based upon uh, saying that you don't need to cut the deficit as fast as the current coalition is arguing. And indeed, their arguments seem to be correct, provided you assume that the OBR, relatively optimistic forecast of what happens to the OBR economy, to, to, to the UK economy, come true. Um, but if you factor in risks surrounding the UK economy, then you know, those deficit reduction arguments, uh, the, the fact that you don't need to re reduce the deficit quickly becomes a slightly riskier strategy. So it, it, the whole debate is actually conditioned by what the OBR is producing and the way it does not adequately handle UK risk at present. So it would be a pity just to tag on to them and continue that, that, that mistake. Okay. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been a very interesting session. I'm just wondering if you have any further points to make before we finally conclude. I one point, which is we, 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 we've discussed the no detriment principle at, at length, but one aspect we haven't discussed is the question, if they are making these section 2.14, 4.14 adjustments, then there'll be issues of indexing those. Um, if they're not making them and that is being swept under the carpet, then the issue doesn't arise. But if these adjustments are made, then they will have to be indexed somehow. And very difficult issues will arise there. But it would be very dangerous to let the Treasury say, oh, we'll sweep all the adjustments and abatements together and we'll do it by hold them indexation or something like that. Because, you know, as I point out in the, in, in the paper, it, probably for the kind of 2.4.14 adjustments, hold them indexation would be totally inappropriate. Okay, Dr. McLaren, any further comments? Um, final comments? I suppose the only other point I'd make is I, this is this is quite complex, as we've seen, um, and it's not something, despite your experience in the pub last night, that is being debated. I don't think, and certainly not understood outside. So, when the final solution comes, I don't know how much of a surprise it will be to the Scottish public, and, and I think some way of somehow getting over what is, in, what is involved here and getting some sort of feedback in terms of whether it's what people want or not would be, um, 
would be beneficial. Quite how you do that, I'm not quite sure. But I mean, it does seem to, you know, we, we had the referendum, we had Smith, and now that we're going to give people something that they may not understand, may not want, may, may, may want, but not exactly in that form. And I think just that interaction with the public, increased interaction with the public, would be, would be good. Yeah, I think that's a point well made. Well, on that, I shall end uh, the session. Uh, I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, for their contributions. And uh, the start of the meeting, we agreed to take the next item in private. I therefore I'd like to close the public part of the meeting. And we'll just have a quick two-minute break um, to enable witnesses and official report to leave.